Here. Present. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Devine. Mr. Davis. Mayor Benjamin. Mayor Benjamin, Mr. Devine is in, is joining us remotely today. Okay. And Mr. Davis is in route. Okay. All right. Now she is she live? Or? Ms. Devine, can you hear us? Oh, I'm sorry. You there, Ms. Devine? Ms. Devine? Yes, ma'am. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Okay, very so we'll good. Say, we'll say I just to uh, uh, recognize your oh, presence. Here. Thank All right. you. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Teresa. We will uh, carry forward our fiscal year 2018 through 2019 budget discussions. I appreciate the time you all have given me and staff. Um, you know, I've called this year of budget discussions a budget of reality. And I'm saying that to many of our employees and former employees who are in the room because that's where we are. Um, we are looking very closely and have labored and struggled and talked about some hard decisions. And it's time for us to explain those decisions, hopefully in a way that our employees, our retirees, and the citizens of Columbia can understand because what the city faces is no different than many other public and private entities across the country. Mayor Benjamin knows in his travels as the U.S. President of the Conference of Mayors, um, sharing some information with me this weekend on the, the hard decisions that all entities are facing when it comes to uh, health care insurance and coverage for people that have given their service to us for a long time, and we don't take that lightly at all. So what we want to start with, Mayor Benjamin, and I want to be real clear about this, is this is a budget workshop. There are no votes made today. This is a time for council to see the recommendations that I put in the city manager's budget, because it is the city manager's budget. The decisions and recommendations that I'm putting before council are those that I've had to come up with this staff. Um, and so this is a presentation period. We had conversations with council, but this is really their first final look at a final budget that's come together. The public hearing for the budget where people can give additional input is on June, June 5th, next Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock, and um, that's when there would be a first reading on the budget, which encompasses these decisions that we have to make regarding retiree health care um, insurance coverage and for our actives as well. So with that, we will get started with the presentation period. The first presentation um, explains, and we want to make sure we're real clear, and as we go through it, if the mayor and council have questions, we'll take those questions um, during the presentation of the Employee and Retiree Health Care Program. Ms. Pamela Benjamin, Human Resources Director and Chief of Staff. Let's, um I want to remind everyone, we have the uh, city manager's conference room is open for folks who may not have seats, uh, some seating there, as well as the chambers are open as well. So as folks show up, just need some place to sit down, um, you can go in both spaces. Still get it live. Ms. Benjamin, who is of no relation to me, I might add. Uh, you say that again. Uh, of no relation. <laughs> I can ask that my question. My very best for us gum voice I can do. We have no relation. I do. I get that question asked of me every day. Good afternoon. As Ms. Wilson just stated, I am here to give a presentation on some of the things that we've discussed during several meetings that we've had with council. Um, we have been, of course, having this discussion for quite some time now, and we've had some recent presentations, one in February, one in April, and um, this is a summation of some of that information. We've also had some smaller meetings with council as well to really get a sense of what decisions we can make that are going to be um, viable to maintain some type of benefit and to make sure that we have um, coverage for our employees as well as, as retirees and which decisions are, that we're going to make. So as you all know, health care costs continue to rise every year. Um, as you can see, the projections, um, they've increased every single year. 
Um, I've just given you some information from 2013, to, from fiscal year 2013 and 2014 up until 2016, 2017, and we're projected at around $25 million for healthcare costs for this particular fiscal year. So that's kind of the trend. You see that trend is increasing every single year. And so every year we do have these discussions about what decisions need to be made in order to maintain health care for our active employees as well as our retirees. So, so we're here again to have that discussion as well. So in some of our prior presentations, you all have been given some information about um, what kind of decisions that you need to make. Um, we'll get to it a little bit later in the presentation, but one of the major decisions that need to be made is, are we going to maintain our DDB? And the DDB is a defined dollar benefit. Uh, that was established back in um, 2014? Yes, in 2014. And um, what we did was we, uh, council, voted to set us a particular amount of money for each retiree and their dependent in order to try and um, cap the liability that we had for our OPEB. Um, liability. And for those of you who don't know what OPEB is, it's, it's our um, retiree benefits. It includes pension and employee health care or retiree health care. So we've looked at different scenarios. Medical and dental. Medical and dental. Not dental. Not dental. It's medical. It's not dental. It's just medical. It's just medical. So we've looked at um, from one extreme to the other. What do we do if we don't maintain our DDB, and how does that affect the liability to maintaining it, and in what mechanism we provide that defined dollar benefit to our retirees? And so as we've gone through these discussions over the last couple of months, we've come up with some recommendations that will go on further, you'll see in the slides. So to start some of the changes or some of the proposed recommendations, we're talking about active employee insurance. So currently, we have presented to you, as part of Ms. Wilson's budget, some ideas about changing employee or active employee health benefits in order to continue to maintain the benefit at a rate that is sustainable for the City of Columbia. So what we're proposing is a phased-in increase to premiums, and we have historically not had that typical 80-20 share that we started out back when Daniel was first on council and they kind of recommended some, some balance to the city contribute 80% and the active employee contribute 20%. We're currently around 88% and 12%. So the recommendation is to move that percentage closer to the 80-20 share. It's so looking at about $20 average per month increase in premiums for active employees. We're also looking at increasing some of the deductibles, the out-of-pockets, maximums, and the co-pays, making some changes to that. And also looking at the pharmaceutical tier structure and changing some of the, the costs for insurance for pharmacy cost. Um, as you all know, we did institute a tobacco surcharge, so we're looking at increasing that from $50 to $100, and also at the concept of a spousal surcharge for spouses who have credible coverage available to them. So in this example, or in this situation, if an employee has their spouse covered, their, their spouse works for an entity that provides health insurance coverage, then in order for that person to remain on the coverage, they'd have to pay an additional surcharge in order to be retained on that, on that employee's coverage. And if the spouse doesn't? Um, if the spouse doesn't, then we would still maintain that benefit for that spouse. And they could pay at the current, whatever the rates are for spousal coverage. Do you might have any other questions about that? So those were the things that we were looking at or recommending for um, the active employees. And is that, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, is, is that still roughly 2,000 active employees? Yes. So we're looking at, we've got um, 2,063. 
employees that are covered. Some of our employees aren't covered because they may be on TRICARE or they may have coverage through their spouses, so they're not covered. But that's what we're looking at. We're looking at about 2,600 employees that are active with us. About 2,063 are covered on our plan. So there are roughly 500 people that have alternative health care, is that mm -hmm. what you're saying? Okay. Yeah. They, like I said, some of them are retired military, so they have TRICARE. Some of them have coverage from another entity. Some of them are retirees from another place, and they're working with us. So they're different scenarios okay. for those people. So the deductible out-of-pocket expenses change. Talk a little bit about that. So depending on what plan you're on, because the city has three different plans. We have a core plan, a buyout plan, and a... Um, a base plan. So depending on what plan you're on, your deductible varies. Um, for example, I'm trying to find a little presentation, the last presentation I had. So just to give you an example, if you currently have, um, you're on the base plan, your deductible is currently um, $2,000. So with the increases that we're talking about, we would raise that deductible from $2,000 to $2,500. And so that, that's one of the examples. Um, Out-of-pocket maximum would go from $7,000 to $7,150. So there's some slight changes. Depending on what plan you, you're on, makes a difference of what your deductibles, your co-pays, um, and your co-insurances are. Does that answer your question? Yes. Sure. Okay. Sure. okay. Pam, so. I was going to say if there was any other context you could give the importance of this spousal surcharge at a time when we're having to make such hard decisions. If you have a spouse who has the opportunity to get coverage, and our coverage has always been as robust as it is a great plan, we get that, um, but at a time like this, when we're having to make such hard decisions that affect retirees and actives and a lot everybody, it to be more equitable, this is a change that um, could help and create some savings because you're, you're you're kind of putting the onus on people to make decisions, um, you know, that affect the whole the whole group of people that we're trying to still maintain coverage for. By they have the opportunity, they're working, they have the opportunity to get coverage at a, a, with their own employer versus the expense that is that is adding to the expense that the city is covering that those additional dependents when they have another opportunity for coverage. Right. I mean, you know, ultimately we're trying to provide insurance coverage to our active working employees right. and our retirees. Um, and so it's, it's not, it's pretty typical for employers to charge a surcharge to allow people to stay on the coverage whenever the employee spouse has coverage that they can get other, other places. So financially, it is our best interest to make sure we're doing what's in the best interest of our active employees. And so that's one of the things that would allow us to do that and spend those resources on those employees who work for us and those spouses who don't have coverage in other places. Um, we see it a lot where our plan is such a great plan that a lot of people forego the coverage that they have in their current employer to be on our plan because our plan is richer, we pay better, um, our deductibles are, are, are lower, our, our premiums are lower than a lot of your other employers. So we see that quite a bit where people are on our plan. But they, they work every day and they have coverage or they have the access to coverage in their current employer. So that, that, is, that is very common. But it does factor into how we make these tough decisions about who gets covered and who doesn't get covered and how those resources are utilized. We've looked at um, $100 per month 
as a surcharge. Um, that's in some of the data that some of our consultants have, have used um, as a proposed surcharge. And most of the larger cities in South Carolina don't allow spouse, uh, don't pay for any spouse coverage at all. They allow them to come on paid for by the employees, but most of the cities in South Carolina pay for the employees, and if they want to cover their families or the spouse, they pay for it separately. But I think we're unique in South Carolina by offering any kind of defined style of benefit beyond the employee itself. Certainly. There, there's certainly a range. You know, you've got all kinds of employers, but some of your major employers, um, they either don't allow spouses on the coverage or they don't supplement that spouse's insurance like we do. So it, it's pretty common. Um, a lot of your, you know, your public entities, they don't allow spouses on the coverage at all. Mm -hmm. Ms. Devine, when she has questions because of the sound quality, she's watching from the stream, and we may have to pause and let her answer her question via text, and we'll relay it. Sure. If you have a question for her, we just need to give her time. And we certainly will, you know, give more specific information about each plan and, and the amounts of the changes. We wanted to let you know that this is a follow-up to our previous conversation, and that based on the information we've shared with you all previously, that this is the direction we're going forward to recommend for active employee health benefit changes. Any other questions on that? So as far as retiree health insurance is concerned, we again, like Ms. Wilson has said, have, have constantly looked at this. I've been here seven years. This has been a, a point of discussion ever since I've been here, and I'm, I'm sure it, it will continue to be um, because this is a challenge for all employers. And we certainly take it very seriously and have considered a lot of the different options out there. But just to give you a little scenario, like I said, in, in 2012, I, I think I said 2014, but actually in 2012, um, the DDB was established for retirees for the other post-employment benefits, the liability. And um, it's, it was about $110 million during fiscal year 2012, 2013. So the DDB placed a cap on the city's contribution for pre-65 um, retirees and is currently at $1,130 per month and $840 per month for dependents. So it's, it's $1,130 per month for the retiree themselves and $840 per month for the dependents. And can you just... It is $1,130 per month for the retiree and $840 per month for the dependent. What is the current enrollment in the pre-65 retirement? Well, I knew you were going to ask me that. I don't have my reading glasses. I had two or three different numbers. That's why I was curious. Um, we're looking at 386. Um, participants. Now, when I say that number, of course, it may vary a little bit based on how many dependents a person has. So we have, for example, we have 24 people that have full family coverage. So they may have three people on their plan. They may have four people. They may have five people. They may have 10 people. So I'm looking at the number of plans that we have for those retirees. And all the city covers about 5,000 lives between active and retirees. So I had, I had roughly the number that was given to me by one, someone in one of these meetings, of roughly 402 pre-65 coverages. Does that sound about right? I guess that depends, got, too, on when you get, got that Yeah, because it fluctuates. Because people roll off and go to post-65. People come on, people... So if we just use people, 400 as an average, that may be a safe number. Okay. Um, the, DB, the DDB for post-65 retirees... Pre-65. Pre-65. Pre so there's a difference between pre-65 and post-65, mm -hmm. right? So the DDB for the post-65, and those are Medicare-eligible retirees, is 
is $300 for the retiree and $225 for the dependent. So it's $300 for the retiree and $225 for the dependent. So that is the amount of money that the city contributes to sets aside for gap coverage, DDB. essentially. Right. So what we do for the post 65 under. is we do we have a supplemental plan mm -hmm. that is offered through United Healthcare. And the post 65 retirees also have to pay a premium for medical and pharmacy, even though we're contributing the DDB currently, because that's the total cost of the plan. Um, based on the fact that it's a small population and their experience is pretty high, then that makes us have to pay around $400 for pharmacy and another, um, another uh, almost $400 for medical. So it's, it's pretty expensive for us to offer that supplemental plan. But again, it's a supplemental plan. Medicare is primary. United Healthcare is a supplemental plan for the post-65. So your, your real cost of supplemental is, is 700 or 400? 300. 300. Mm -hmm. Right. On top of the city's, what the city's already paying. Right. So you're really talking about 700 right. per person. Right. And the market out there is much less if it's done individually, correct? It absolutely According is. According to it's some of the retirees who've not taken it and gone and done their own, they're paying right. significantly less per month for supplemental. That is correct. Because we're having to create a program specifically for that. That's why the costs are so high. Exactly. And we do, from time to time, we hear from our post-65 retirees who say, I could get a cheaper plan out there on my own if I just go out to, you know, AARP or United mm -hmm. Healthcare, I can get my ch a cheaper plan. And we say, you're, you're absolutely right. Because you may, depending on your personal situation, be able to get a plan that's much cheaper. So that is something that we hear quite often. Um, in FY18, the city is contributing more than the DDB amount as a result of not increasing retiree premiums and not making any plan changes. So because we haven't increased retiree premiums and we haven't really maintained that DDB, we're here facing some really significant um, decisions. Um, if the city fails to maintain the DDB going forward, its OPEP liability could go up two to four times higher by fiscal year 2047. And we're looking at a billion dollar liability. So that's why we've looked at some hard decisions. You might, you are, uh, someone's bringing it back home, why, why 2047 is important and how that affects our budgeting today and year after year. And maybe what that what that billion dollar liability means in terms of uh, some our annual contributions and, and the like. It's I mean in simple terms, we won't be able to to cover our active employees, let alone retirees, going into the future if we continue at the pace that we are. I mean that that's just an unheard of liability to bear. You can't do it. Twenty four to seven. Yeah, it's the 30-year window. Of course, we it's, it's 30 years out, and we have had actuarial studies done looking at our current population and the, all the, the factors that they look at during the actuarial stu study as far as age, gender, um, length of, of um, morbidity, um, there are all these factors that go into how they come up with the, the actual study. But 2047 is 30 years out. Sure. So we're looking at how yeah, that. And we're, and we're required to compete, compute and show those that, that long-term liability over 30-year horizon. And then we have to set aside funds each year to meet that long-term liability. Do we have a number that shows us what, what that looks like uh, um, to meet a uh, We're talking about a lot of money. We're, we're on talk, an we're annual talk, basis, talk, how much would we be We're talking about, we're talking about an inability not just to, not just to cover health care expenses, but an inability to cover basic uh, services for Correct. the city if we don't get our arms around it. 
Right. So, I, mean, I think that's we make sure people understand we're not the gravity about, of it. We're exactly. not we're not just talking about insurance um, for retirees or even active employees. We're talking about uh, an inability uh, to meet basic services if we don't get arms around around uh, the expense long term. Yes, sir. So, that's that's true. Okay, so um, as we've talked through the months, um, the decision has been made of, of whether we're going to maintain that DDB or not, because um, that's one huge decision. And then if we do, what mechanism is that going to look like? And then it's also been a decision, or it needs to be a decision made, of who will be eligible for the retiree health insurance benefits going forward um, after this fiscal year on forward. So when we looked at some possible decisions about what to do, we looked at creating a health reimbursement account based on the current DDB and the amount for the 365 retirees. The HRA would be based on that 1130 or that 840 um, for those employees who are current 365 retirees and employees hired prior to July 1st, 2009, that meet eligibility requirements for retirement. So we looked at how do we cap that population? How do we um, give some of our longer-term employees the benefit of having health insurance when they retire? Um, how do we make sure that we're providing something to those long-term long employees and our current retirees. So um, those were two of the decision points that, that we're recommending based on Ms. Wilson's budget. We're also looking at the possibility of eliminating post-65 coverage for retirees, and that would be eliminating the DDB for that population and they would no longer be receiving that $300 or $225 uh, DDB, depending on whether they're a retiree or a dependent. Um, we've also um, looked at adding an age requirement to be 55 years of age, in addition to the requirement for the 20 years of service with the um, City of Columbia. And that 20 years of service is based on those employees that were here prior to July 1st of 2009. So that's the eligibility requirement for employees that, are, that were here prior to July 1st, 2009. After July 1st, 2009, it changed to 25 years for police officers' retirement and 28 years for regular retirees. So that's where that, that line was drawn. It wasn't an arbitrary line, but that, that's, that's where that line was drawn. What we find is our average age for our retirees, our pre-65 retirees, is about 57 years old. So a lot of our pre-65 retirees go on and have other employment and have some of them, a lot of them, have the opportunity to get coverage with their current employer. So we were looking at how do we balance between offering coverage to people who don't have the opportunity to have coverage and those employees or, or those retirees who may have the opportunity to have coverage at other places. Have, did, did you look at... Mr. Brickman, I'm sorry. Okay. We're getting questions or comments online. If you all can make sure you're speaking into your microphones or not covering your microphones, I think we're able to hear you as well. Thank you. So... It was actually online. It was from Tamika. Yeah. I'm sorry. It was online. Mm -hmm. So... As we look at, you know, number two, which an HR account is something we've talked about since we do have money put away and it's a way to, to feed that and you keep the regular. Have you looked at, you, you have eliminated post-65 coverage for retirees. What, what is, based on the population we have today, and can, can we not put an HRA account together for that to carry those folks who are in the system I mean, they have a better opportunity to get a better quality health care. Um, and to be quite honest, it's, it's savings on this side of the fence, too, because we're overpaying to cover them today. Um, mm -hmm. And they're not getting a better coverage. To create an HRA account for them as well. Certainly. And still be able to, to, to maintain our balance, because that's, that's what we're looking at at this point. I mean, mm -hmm. To me, that makes more sense. 
right, right they, now we're we're the numbers you know staggering yeah we are these are recommendations we certainly can tweak and make adjustments to those um, we have looked at options because you all know we had those options one through three that were presented um i think when was that was that in april and one of those options allowed for continuing the ddb for that post 65 group so that is one of the options that we presented to you all in the past we certainly can make that adjustment to this list of recommendations but we could set it up the same way where we could absolutely we set it up the same so, way I mean, based on line item two if you went in i think i, I figured out today that's almost about Thirteen and a half thousand dollars per employee, three sixty-five employee. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and like you said, the the There's HRA an additional ten if you add a spouse that's other, um, you know, which is a lot of money as well. So you're really talking about if there's an employee and a spouse together that don't have options, we're contributing twenty-three thousand dollars into an HRA account. That's correct. So let, let go ahead. Uh, Ms. Benjamin, what's the savings to the city if we eliminate spousal coverage for the active as well as the retirees? Do you know that figure? I, I don't know that figure off the top of my head. It's been I, I, I really, Mr. Rickman's already said it's ten thousand dollars. That's just for post. That's for post. post. Yeah. Right, so th if there's a there's a totally different contribution rate for active employees. Than well, it if is. you eliminate it for active that have credible coverage elsewhere, would that not be a substantial savings in itself? We certainly it, it would eliminate a group of a population of of covered participants for um, those that have credible coverage elsewhere. You, but you mean and don't do the surcharge. Don't do the surcharge. Just eliminate, just eliminate the coverage. Eliminate the coverage if you have creditable coverage elsewhere. And I, I'm sure Ms. Ms. Devon is probably going to chime in here as well. Um, what, what's what's the threshold for credible coverage elsewhere? How do we how do we determine that? What, it, it, there's a um, an ACA and an IRS um, threshold for for determining what credible coverage is. It it based it's based on how much it costs mm -hmm. um, and how much of your income that coverage will cost you to have that. Um, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad. It, it's a it's an income ratio. And I'd, I'd have to get that. You, you, you would object, objectively subjective. Okay. Credible, yeah. credible coverage. Surcharge doesn't, doesn't. There is a doesn't there is a help. definition for it. You'll be back here in twelve yeah. months having to change it again. Yeah. It just doesn't that's work. A, I'll I will look it up for you. I don't. I don't you have you would have a. No. You'll have a model for us on that. that we can look at. Mm -hmm, certainly. Um, you know, one of the things that um, we can look at it. Yeah. We can look at the definition of what credible coverage is. Um, <laughs> it is it is certainly a recruiting tool and a retention tool for us to be right. able to offer health insurance for our active employees' spouses. Um, that's a that's a really significant thing for us, and so we really hadn't considered eliminating that but we certainly will look at the numbers but if they had creditable coverage elsewhere that wouldn't be such a big recruiting tool it would be a recruiting tool if they didn't have that coverage coming Which coming in the door you mean coming in coming yeah, into we, the system we'll certainly look at it i mean there are um employers who do that who don't offer coverage to employee spouses who have credible coverage and they're active so that is something that that we certainly can look at. I think we need to look at that seriously. I think that will be a last question when you get a chance. Yes, ma'am, Mr. Devon, go ahead. Um, okay, just two things. Um, this is part of my delay. So go back to the retirees and their coverage. Um, so if a retiree has the option of coverage somewhere else, um, how do we know that? And, and the reason I'm asking is I know in the past we've had retirees that had other jobs that had option to be covered somewhere else, but because our coverage is so good, they've declined the coverage other somewhere else. It would be an affidavit. I mean, I know that we could, you know, there's only so much we can do to, to dig into that factually, but I mean, certainly we would expect people to be um, honest, and, and there's a process 
mm-hmm. that the human resources department would go through, um, you know, to seek that information. But once we've asked and we get an answer and it's on an affidavit, I mean, that's what we would have to go by, essentially. I think there's some other steps, but to, mm-hmm. you know, that's about as far as probably we would go to determine that. And for the spouses, we would have um, everybody who has a spouse submit us a letter from the from the HR department of their spouse's employer saying that they don't have credible coverage. So we get the affidavit okay, and, that, and we get the question, letter. That first question was really, it was about the retirees, the employees the, themselves, themselves, not the spouse. Yeah, um, they, they would have to just, we would have to. I'm just thinking um, along those lines because I know that's, and um, expensive part of our coverage. Mm-hmm. And then my, my second question and, and comment along the lines of, of the spouse, and, you know, I think the third charge is fair, um, you know, and maybe part of that is looking at, um, you know, what that surcharge is so that, you know, it is, it is fair and compensates us a little bit. But, you know, I would reiterate what I've said before. I think that we, we do have... Um, that concern as far as recruitment and retention of our current employees. We talked about this in the past where someone can leave the city and make um, much more in the private sector, especially when you're talking about engineering or, um, you know, folks with the, the skill sets that we need. And, and part of the, the allure of the city is I think that we have a, a good health care coverage. And if you consider adjusting it to the point where that, um, that amount doesn't encourage them to stay anymore. I think that we're running in a risk. So I think we need to look at all options as far as, as families. But when you're looking at people with younger families, and I know we can't exclude uh, children, but when you think about spouses, we have folks who have spouses who may not work, or we have spouses that don't have uh, coverage other places. And I think that a surcharge is probably the best is a fair option for us to look at as far as keeping those folks and, and as a recruitment and a retention tool. We'd have we'd be required to to get to offer them insurance anyway, Tamika, if they didn't have other insurance. We couldn't you right. couldn't just yeah. deny right. spouse. Right. If they don't have credit it's, it it will turn on the credible coverage piece. Well I, no I'm I'm actually going to Mr. Duvall's comment. I mean I, I don't know would his comment or would, would his suggestion require us, even if they didn't have credible, because we keep talking, there's two different things here. We're talking about credible color coverage somewhere else, and then we're talking about eliminating them all together. And I think those are two different conversations. And I'm, they I'm, are. And my, my suggestion would be if they have creditable coverage elsewhere, to eliminate them from both active employees and retired employees. And, and furthermore, I, what I would like to do is look at the savings that we could accumulate, especially if we eliminate spousal coverage with credible coverage in the active ranks. That's going to be several million dollars and put that back into employee benefits that would, that would help all 2,000 of our employees rather than the small percentage that would fit the criteria of having a spouse or a family that needs coverage. Um, a lot of employers, if they do that, they those spouses that don't have access to coverage would either pay the full amount, um, they would pay our portion, city's portion, and the premium portion. So that's that's what a lot of employers do. If their spouses don't have credible coverage, they may charge them the total cost for that coverage. Well, so there, not, there are ways to kind of work around it. No. Our, and apparently I'm getting calls so that it's difficult for people to hear us online. Um, so all of us, let's see if we can lean up a little more into the, into the microphones as we, as, we, as we speak. All right. Thank you. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about what this HRA looks like, what, how it would, how it would um, um, provide some benefit to our retirees. Um, What an HRA is, essentially, a health reimbursement account, that would go into that amount that we set aside right now for the DDB, the the 1130 and the 840 would go on into an HRA account. That HRA account would be used by the retiree 
because in this situation we're talking about the pre and potentially the post 65, that would go into an account and what they would do with that those funds is they could use it to pay their health insurance premiums, health plan deductibles, cost for doctor's office visits, prescriptions, x-rays, any other IRS approved medical expenses. So what in essence it would be, instead of us having a retiree health insurance plan, we would give each individual retiree their DDB, and then they would be able to go out and shop for their own plan. So for some of our retirees, it would certainly be a cheaper situation than for others. So for example, we've got one here. This is an example of a pre-Medicare retiree, an individual that's 60 years old in Richland County, because what we've already done is one of our consultants, and we gave this to you in a prior presentation, they did an analysis of the plans that are offered out there. And as you can see, the plans are broken down into bronze, silver, or gold. And depending on which plan the person chooses would depend on their deductibles, out-of-pocket maximums, and then what their monthly premiums would be. So for example, if you look down at the bottom where it says retiree pays, some retirees could pay nothing for their coverage. Our DDB could cover the entire cost of their coverage. Um, others may have to pay more depending on which level of coverage they choose. Um, and it also depends on where you are located geographically. But there are definitely plans available out there that the retiree would be able to take advantage of. And if we did that for the post-65, there are even more plans that are available for that population because of um, there, there's just more, there's more activity in the market for post-65 um, retirees. And I, didn't, I don't think I included a slide for that because I didn't think that was one of our options. But we certainly have researched and looked at what those plans look like, how they're tiered, and what that will look like for the retiree. So it's, it's really a replacement of the benefit. And again, they would have the opportunity to go out, search the market, and find uh, a plan that's available for them. We certainly would not be, be forcing them to do that by themselves. We would hire a navigator who would sit down with the retiree, each of them, because they each have different medical and different personal situations, and help them navigate and choose which plan is best for them. So it would be based on what their current health is, what kind of prescriptions they take, those types of things, in order to make the decision of which plan is, is most um, suitable for them. And then they would use that money on the HRA to pay for their premiums, and they would also use it for any other medical <coughs> IRS-approved um, medical expenses that they may have. You might have any questions about that? Such as, Pam, maybe talk about IRS-approved medical expenses. So, for example, well, it would be like, runs the like co-pays, prescriptions, um, you know, any kind of fees that you're charged in your doctor's office. Um, it would be, um, you know, insulin or, or any type of things like that. Things that um, wouldn't be covered would be like plastic surgery, like Botox, like things that are elective, they may not be covered. Um, that varies. The IRS changes what's covered and what's not covered. Um, each year seems like it because you used to could buy um, over-the-counter medications now that's you can't do that as much anymore or at all for, for most of them so it would just depend on what the IRS regulations are but it, it's going to be most of your high dollar or your routine medical expenses that you be paying now with your coverage now your co-pays your co-insurances your out-of-pocket charges you know, if you go to the doctor and they give you a bill because you got an x-ray, you could pay for that using your HRA funds. Um, so it's, it's going to be most of your standard medical um, expenses. And if it, if it doesn't run out on a year and during the course of one year, what would happen to it? It depends on how we set up our HRA accounts. Um, depends on if we set a maximum 
Some of them, it just continues to roll over no matter what. Others have caps. It would depend on how we design our HRA account to, to, to what would happen with those funds. Some of them, if you don't use it by the end of the year, then the funds go away. Others allow you to carry over some of it or all of it. It would depend on how we structured it. Well, can, can you possibly just give me a little background because I, I'm struggling with just the, the number a little bit. You know, from an employee standpoint, we have a DBA and, and that could continue to grow. We're using this $1,130 for the- A DDB? The, yeah, for the retiree, right. But the spousal number, seems kind of high to me that we're contributing 75 percent but the employee is our responsibility i mean have we looked at changing those numbers where you and it could, you could call it a shift or whatever but it seems to me our responsibility is to the employee first and foremost and long term than it is to mm -hmm. to an individual that didn't work at the city spouse or whatever I mean I don't know everybody's situations differently mm -hmm. I'm just sitting here looking at the numbers and going you know there's there's different ways to to attack this and you know is the obligation that we need to be putting forward to the individual that that worked here and and, and that was their contribution because it's hard to rationalize that you're 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 paying 75 percent of of somebody's cost that, that didn't work here well, instead of paying 100% of the cost of the person who did. I'm just throwing out food for thought as you're looking at these numbers. Well, and the DDB that's set up now was established in 2012, so we were just in an effort to maintain that current DDB. That's what the recommendations are based on. Um, you know, an actuarial study was done, and those were the recommendations made by the consultant at that time. Um, we can certainly look at adjusting that DDB to give more to the retiree and less to the spouse. Um, I mean, our obligation and would be to the to the employee or, or retiree. First certainly. and foremost. We can certainly look at that. But we were just maintaining what and that's what all the you know, all of our projected cost mm -hmm. and all of our projected liability is based on that current DDB that was established back in 2012. And so that's kind of, you know, what we've used as a guidepost for, for the data that you all have seen previously. But we can certainly look at that. Yeah, it's still, to me, it still becomes a question of your first and foremost responsibility should be to the employee who worked here. He's saying that he, he's saying that he gets a bad job of, as you're doing math here, and some employees um, maybe not ever having it come out of pocket, others having it come out of pocket, actually helping meet those employees' needs first before you extend uh, your obligation to, to spouses. So. It's just a just well it's from a contribution standpoint mm -hmm. I mean it just it, it doesn't make it does, the math just doesn't make sense it seems like, it seems like much again I mean, like I mean, Missy said but it was based on the 80 20 and the premiums at the time because we were we were looking at all those figures back in 2012 and we did we haven't recalculated that DDB haven't increased it for inflation anything like that yeah it might be worth it doing Take a look at what that number would be today, reflective of today, based on the employee pre pre sixty five or I mean, post sixty five. It's it's clear that the better deal and the better coverage is to do it individually. Just a question on, question on that. Um, <clears throat> we have that formula now, as you said, because that was the standard or the mark the, the mark model in twelve. If we go back, when you research different models, looking at spouse not contributing at all, um, we would or could um, maybe come up with a with a model that maybe not contributing that much to an, a spouse that's not contributing, but not totally eliminating them. 
Well, I think, I mean, for us, I think we have a multitude of options. Yeah. I think we want to figure out what the best option that, the realistically, that is sustainable. And where we are today is not sustainable, as you've seen the number. Right. I mean, it's just not possible. We can sit here and try to lie to everybody. Everything can maintain the way it is, but it wouldn't. Five years, you won't have health care. So the reality is we, we have to make some changes here, and we need to figure out what's best. But I think there's an obligation, first and foremost, to one group over another, and I think we need to look at it that way. Just food for thought. No, I, but until no, we put I'm the not. numbers on the board, you can't. I mean, you just you can't do that. But it's just it seems interesting that the percentages are done that way. Well, I think it probably goes to also just the more the philosophical discussion of it all as well, and some of the points maybe Miss Devine was raising. I mean, that is that has been the model that the city has done for many, many years. When I came to the city, I always tell the story, I was shocked because I came from a different institution, a private industry, and I was getting my first paycheck and, and noticed I didn't pay have to pay for my health care insurance. I was shocked. I was like, where's the money taken out of my check? So over time, there's just there's been a, a wonderful um, system here at the city to, to do everything we could to take care of the employees and the spouse. Children are still, you know, by law we'd have to take care of mm -hmm. children and dependents. But spouses, I think it goes to, is it a recruitment tool? Is it something that has been a recruitment tool and now we can't really maintain that anymore? I think the what we presented was based off kind of where we've where been and not um, well, I mean, going away from that philosophical. Well, I think it could be overall the systems change. You can go to Greenville, you go to Charleston, they all have different, you know, a lot of them are eliminated post-65. Other people are, are paying in this. They don't take spouses. Right. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's constantly changing. Exactly. I think recruitment's changed. I don't think you have as many people who, who come and work for 20, 25 Correct. years like you used to. Correct. I mean, things have changed. The opportunities, people are more mobile today. They don't stay in communities as long. I mean, there are all these factors that we could look at. But the reality is, is 2008, nine, our health care was $14, 15000000 million, and now we're at double. You know, and that wasn't that long ago, so, you know, making those challenges but still being able to provide for those folks who who work here and, and served here, I, you know, I think that's our, we got to try to come up with a good balance on that. And, you know, just, you just can't have everything, so we've got to figure out what's, where's our priority. Well, the best recruiting tool would be to get our starting pay and follow-on pay up by using the savings we're going to have from health care, so that would go to everybody that works for the city of Columbia. Pay is the best recruiter. You'd have to have some savings to pay it, to pay pay. It's, uh, it's, it's a... Protocol is no, but I, but the question is I, I do want I do want to make sure they're asked and answered. So are you done yet? Oh, the, the question is. The same. I am. Uh, okay. I did I did have a question concerning when we got to the 2009 and we were backing up the 2009 and it was on the second page that said if uh, you know there would be no coverage until the age of 55 or 20 years of service. Does that mean if you left after 2009, if you were prior to 2009 employee, or does that mean you know, if I've got a 52-year-old person that's eligible for retirement today, can he not retire for 55? Now, okay, so there are two different things going on here, right? So one of them is their their eligibility to retire through the through the South Carolina retirement system. So a person could potentially retire because they have the years of service with the South Carolina retirement system. Then there's the eligibility for our retiree health insurance. So there are two separate eligibility requirements. But the average person so. So, so current retirees would be eligible for the benefit. It would be going forward. 
for new 2019 hires. forward, you'd have to be 55 years That's old. That's new hires. Forward. Or if you're retirement eligible with your years, and there's so many, Pam will have to help me with this because I know I'll mess it up. There's so many um, ways now that you'd have to count your retirement eligibility if the rule of 90 applies starting in 2014, correct, Pam, through the state retirement system. Um, if you were with the city prior to 2009, then if we, at that point in time, you only had to have 20 years with the city, um, and you wouldn't have had to get to the 25 or 28 years. So it's all going to depend on the individual. But assuming you, you could retire before January 1 of 2019, mm -hmm. then you would be able to go ahead and retire and take advantage of, of this system. And not be 55. And not be 55. And not be 55. I think what he's trying to ask is if you were hired before 2009, does the 55 age apply that no. 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 It's not retro no. to come back. It does not. It just seemed like that was one of the only things that wasn't clear. If we agree with it or not, obviously we've got right. different opinions over here, but that wasn't what was clear mm -hmm. on that. Um, so up to this point, we've had no age requirement. Right. So if we retire after January, does the 55 rule different? Potentially, if this, if all, you know, if that's one of the recommendations that's accepted. Not if you were hired before. Not, not if you were hired before 2009. Not if you were hired before. Yes, ma'am. No, that's that's. You would have to be retired now or retire by January 1 of 20, 2019 in order to not have to meet the 55-year requirement. So you'd have to be an active retiree now or a person who retires by 1231 of 2018 in order to be under 55. After January 1st, 2019, you'd have to be 55 years of age in addition to meeting the other requirements. Retire. I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't. Someone asked something. Couldn't see you or hear. Question. Yeah, that's what that's we're what doing. Yes, we're doing right now. I mean, so, so it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be easier. Now, listen, don't, I don't, no, we want questions, not a speech. Okay, so the main, 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 main reason I ask the question is actually ask the question and get an answer. Um, so we, we, so that's, that's the only rule of asking questions. You actually have to ask a question. It's not post-speech. But this is an opportunity. Typically, uh, work sessions don't have Q&A, but I know there are a lot of questions. They're going to help inform us as we, as we move forward. If you've got a question, yeah, please come and do it. And it, it. It's probably easier to do it from where you are, um, but I wonder if in the interest, interest of posterity, we need to do more um, at the microphone. I don't know. We don't have a walk around, might do. Um, I don't think we do. That's sad. Um, We'd have um, to it, but that's not that. Yeah. So. Um, what that means. So let's uh, let's go ahead. And, is, that, is, that, is that okay with y'all? Let's go. Yeah. 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 I don't have a problem. Have questions? Yeah. 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 Let's, let's, go, let's go ahead and um, and um, ask them. So. Um, don't we? Not the. Go raise your hand. We got everybody get a chance to ask a question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Let's, let's, let's make sure she's kind of finished. Okay, I'm sorry. Are you done? I think she's in the question section. I'm sorry. Yeah. We're okay. ready yeah. for questions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she's ready for questions. You want me to come up yeah. here, or how do you want to? Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to get a walk around mic, if not for the time being. Yeah, let, let, let's, we, we're going to try to find a walk around mic, y'all, but only because folks who weren't able to be here are also watching online and want to be able there. We probably have questions to ask that they can't ask from where they are. So um, if you don't mind, come up front and, and ask me a question. That'd be Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. any, any, any yes, ma'am. Yeah, actually, uh, state your name, your name for the record, and, 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 and the question. My name's uh, Matthew Hershaw. I work for the fire department. Yes, sir. Just some things to consider. I got hired when I was 18 years old, 
as of January 1st, 2019, if that 55 year old age went into effect, you have multiple firemen having to do 36 years in the fire service to maintain that coverage. It's just some things to consider for guys who got in at an earlier age. And that's a long time in the fire service or police service. And so, and, and so let me counter a little bit with that, which I understand what you're saying, and I think that's still a recommendation we're looking at. But I guess you would also have to understand that because of that age and the ability for you to continue to work and work another job, which many of you also do at a very young age, that also is a factor with you being able to have coverage somewhere else potentially where you can get insurance and still be getting the insurance from the city. So there's you got to look at both sides of it. But, that, but that's that's a very legitimate but concern. It is. Thank you. Thank you for raising that. Thank you. And we, and we looked at that because of course we we know the age and the demographics of our workforce. So definitely. Um. I was curious as to why have we explored the state health care plan name? Oh, I'm sorry, Investigator Mostella, um, Police Department. Have we explored the state health care plan? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because I, I was looking at it that y'all currently pay eight thousand dollars more a year, and it's about thirty-five hundred dollars less. So I just was curious if y'all. It's not apples and oranges yeah. comparison. It's a different, it's a different school. So you've got to understand too that they have a whole lot more people. You need to talk in the mic, Pam. Sorry. Um, you know, insurance is a numbers game, and the state health plan has a whole lot more covered people than we do. They have, like, 500,000. Right, 500,000 people. So when you talk about getting the premiums in for 500,000 people, th that's a big difference between the 2,600 employees that we have. The, the oh, coverage is not comparable. If, if it isn't as good a coverage. No, but it'll be better than what y'all are offering. No, no, no. <laughs> that's just not. Uh, I'd have to argue with you on that one. Yeah. Um, and I also have a concern about the 55 and older. When I, when I came here, you told me I had to work 20 years. You promised that to all people that were hired before 2000, that we only had to work 20 years. I understand it not being free, but so you're telling me I'm going to have to work 15 more years to take my, to take my insurance payment. I'm not very pleased with that, and a lot of us are not because I have given my time in of 25 years, but I will still have to work eight more years just to take my insurance that I should be entitled to anyway because I'm an employee of the city. Yes, ma'am. We understand that concern. Just, just so people who are, some people don't know, so currently what the cutoff date, so you have to be, you have to do 25 years in in, if you're, to, to get retirement. Right. Correct. It, it depends. Depends on, on when you, you were hired. To, right. Because if people who are currently here who just got hired, they have to work the rule of 90. So they have to work 30 years and be 60 years old or whatever that age and, and retirement years state equal. Law. State, state law. law. State law. That's the state law. So right. Something we should look into is how do we just match it to the same way? Because it, that way it gives you, it gives people the opportunity who have been in one segment in another. Well, you did do that in 20, in 2009, we met, I mean, we do We matched it for what it was at that time. time. It's changed right. since changed then. changed again. Because mm. right. that's, that's it was 25 and 28 and, right. and when we made that change. And what is it now? It's the rule of 90. Rule of 90. Mm -hmm. Rule of 90 is more stringent than safety. Not right. Safety, 25. Yeah. 20. You're still subject to the rule of 90. 90. Yeah. Everybody's subject to the rule of 90. So that's the other, I, we understand exactly what you're saying, but hmm. what if we didn't add that caveat about before 2009 <clears throat> and the 20 years, then you would have been following the 25 or the rule of 90. Right. Correct. Right. Or you think y'all could grandfather us in like you did when you changed the 20 years to the people that have to work more than 20 now to get their retirement. I would feel it would be fair to grandfather us in. Well, we are grandfathering you in by adding employees hired before July 1st, 2009. Because that wasn't originally when you just looked at what the consultant presented to us to do. They didn't even do that. So yeah. this is an additional 
thing that we've come back and done, and, and we did that because you're right. In 2009, there was a set of rules for the city to get insurance work in 20 years. Right, and, and employees, even employees after 2009 have to work 25 or 28 years. Mm -hmm. Those employed after 2014 have to work the rule of 90. So it mm -hmm. just... The so, eligibility changes. Can you just clarify, because I'm having a hard time following mm -hmm. it. To me, if, if an employee was hired between before 2009, mm -hmm. then whenever they're set that time frame, what did we say, 25 years? Is that what I understood? It was 20 years 20 before years. 2009. So whenever that segment is in, mm -hmm. that's what this should be said, correct? Mm -hmm. Right, but my understanding is she just... That, so that means that if I was hired in 2000, my 20 years is in two years, but because that was going to say 55, I would have to work my retirement eligibility time we plus, plus, day. plus day. Yeah, if, if, that's what I'm if, saying. It, 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 so you're not retirement eligible. You won't be retirement right. eligible. It didn't make you're sense. talking about maintaining insurance after, after leaving two years, not retiring. I, I'm retirement eligible in seven years, but if this 55 requirement is added on, then I won't be able to take my insurance for 15 more years, meaning that I will have to work eight years past my retirement just to get insurance that comes from me in my pocket. Because you're telling me I would have to work till 55 to take the insurance. It is the way I'm involved in I'm, I'm a gentleman. I'm never going to ask your age, okay? But I'm trying to keep up with the numbers That's here, fine. okay? That's all right, fine. all right, okay. Wait. Okay, all right. But the way I'm understanding it is if this goes increments, then I would have to work 15 more years to take my retirement. My when did you start with the city? 2000. And, and it will depend on, you know, how old you were when you started as to, you know, if, if we did institute that age requirement. And I just don't think that is fair to those of us. I'm 40. I'm, I'm trying to say it. But that's why I'm saying 50, would be 15 more years. I just don't think that's fair for those of us that have given you 18, 20, 25 years. And now you're going to tell me I'm going to have to work eight more to take after I have gonna, well, let me not. You're going to stop working when you, you're not going to go work anywhere else when you stop working with the city at that age. Probably not. I don't want to work for these. You get 1.82% for every year you work past your 20 or 25 or 28. That's something we ought to clarify. I don't, I don't, I don't want to work 36 years. Though. What's the numbers right? I'm ready for you to get a deal. That, that's the point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. God, if I could retire at 40, I'd be happy. I'd be retired. Hi, I'm Deborah Martin, also known as DK. I retired in 2012 from the police department. I was a lieutenant with them. Uh, my question is uh, under the HRA. Uh, you're t uh, saying that we would have to, uh, if that's what's going on, then we would have to, uh, with the use of a navigator, get our own insurance. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. My question is, if you have pre-existing conditions, how is that going to impact you being able to get insurance? Uh, you know, I, I've been insured by the city of Columbia since 1987. So my insurance, and I understand, I, I, you know, I appreciated that I didn't have to pay. I was a single person, or I am a single person. But when I go to look at, I've had some health issues that have cropped up in the last couple years. So if I go and look for new insurance, how is that going to impact me with my, you know, I have pre-existing conditions now. So that's... That's something I would like to have answered, if you can answer that question, please. So uh, currently under the ACA, there are no pre-existing condition exclusions or, or that, that's, that doesn't factor into whether or not you get co that's coverage or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Certainly, no, things can change, and they certainly do. But currently under the ACA, Regulations, pre-existing conditions can't be used to 
not provide somebody with insurance coverage. Pam, talk about the talk about the network in in this area. Well, for someone in in her situation or any of our retirees who would be using the navigator. I mean, there's it's not like we're Florida, as you've often said. In South Carolina, um, there's going to be the blues and other um, groups that would probably um, be where they would be getting their coverage from. I don't know, and this is a question, um, being that, you know, whatever our working relationships are through the navigator with those potential um, coverages for these folks, if that's something we could inquire about on their behalf about pre-existing conditions and that sort of thing. I mean, we'll do our best well, ag to... Again, the ACA prohibits people from... I understand from that, but it's in her concern that if that were to go away and now we you know, sending them out to the market. Is there anything, any considerations that we can discuss with the providers? Um, I don't know. We'd have to look at that. I'm not sure. I mean, they would be they would be looking at coverages on the open market. So whatever those coverages were okay. providing is what would be out there. Cool. I, I don't know that we could, you know, have any influence over that. Because if that was the case, we'd be creating our own plan again and kind of getting back to where we are now. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't know that we could influence that in any way. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Dan Beatenball. Um, I'm from the private sector. My wife is a retiree at, here at the city, and it sounds like to me a lot of this is based on a defined dollar benefit, which is set up in 2012, and basically. <laughs> My whole understanding of insurance is the young help pay for the old. And y'all have never had two insurances, one for employees and one for retirees. And this whole meeting, I think most of the retirees are missing it, is now there's going to be two insurances. And it sounds like y'all are trying to balance your budget by putting a lot of the cost on the retirees, not that you have numbers up here this time. But that's my question is, why not have one insurance that covers retirees and employees? That's that's, that's part of the problem. That's what we have. That's, that's part of the problem. That's why it's years. costing so much because it costs us seven hundred dollars for a retiree when the open market is roughly two hundred in a supplement. We're having to create a program in ourselves. That's that's part and, of and the And that's issue. because you're covering eighty eight percent of two thousand people when you should be covering eighty percent and you have a lot of retirees, only 300, who are, of course, costing you more because these people have served the city 30 years as firemen and everything else, have a lot of health issues. And so a retiree is going to cost you more. They're older. They're sicker. In all fairness, it's not, it's not just that. You have to look at it globally in that question because we've also been supplementing spouses, families, and everything else. So you can't just say it's just one individual and that this group is carrying this group because that's, that's not true. We've got individuals who have never, or a family, let's use a family of four, who've never cost the city anything really other than their, their, their premium. But then we got individuals who've cost the city five times what the rest of the groups cost. So, so it's just saying that the there's not two separate groups. So that's why they're having a separate. No, that's not at all what we're saying. What we're saying is, is that we have one, we've had one insurance the whole time, but we've created a program to carry when there's better options that we should be looking at that provide better coverage and care. We're spending extra money just to cover, which doesn't make sense. Okay. It doesn't make sense. As long as, like I say, my, my money, main concern is the retirees who have served the city for so long get a fair plan that is affordable. And, and, that's, and that's, 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 that's exactly that's what we're concern. trying to do. And, 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 we're trying to make it sustainable. And, and, I, and, I, and I promise you that's our concern, too. That's the reason we're sitting here. Uh, and if, we're yeah. looking at afford, affordability, whether they're with us or they, they're in the private sector. Let me say this, y'all. And, 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 and I know, I know um, this is always a, a, a tough issue to discuss. And I, I told myself I was going to listen more than I talk today because uh, I, I really want to, if we have more questions, I want people to ask their questions too and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get some more concern, uh, some more concerns um, addressed. 
Uh, this is a, a, a great deal different than, uh, than what our consultants brought back to us. Uh, this is not an exercise in balancing the budget. And, and, I, and, I, and I always hate when it's, when it's characterized as something that's just as simple as that. This is not balancing the budget. This is indeed uh, an, an exercise in just pure sustainability. How do we make sure that people have access to health insurance courage, coverage as long as we possibly can? and make sure it's affordable for as many of our folks, current employees, retirees, and if we can, their families as well, as long as we possibly can. Cities all across this country are eliminating health insurance coverage, eliminating it. Not reducing it, eliminating it. Cities, counties, and states. So I, I, I don't want you to think that, that we're going through some callous uh, um, uh, penciling of, of, a, of a budget process here that seeks to deny someone anything. I mean, believe me, if we could, if we could have universal coverage for everybody uh, with, within, within the, 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 our reach, uh, whether it be city employees or dependents or anyone else, we would do that. It is not sustainable. It's not sustainable. So this is an exercise in, in, in fiscal responsibility and fiscal courage and just pure sustainability. How do we make sure that not only do we provide health insurance coverage, but how are we making sure that we're actually able to provide fire protection coverage for the people of the city, police protection coverage, basic services. I mean, that's what this discussion is about. It is not sustainable to look at 30 years down the line to have a billion dollar non-pension related long-term liability. It's just not. It's just not. And it, and it, it, would, be, it would be not just imprudent, but irresponsible for us to not go through this process and figure out how we can do this in as thoughtful and as fair a way possible. I promise you that's where our heads are, that's where our hearts are. That's where we're trying to get to. It is a tough process. It's a tough process, not, not just for you all, but for each and every one of us, for the people in, the, in this room, that many of whom you, you may know and you, and you, and you, and you love and have worked side by side with for, for years. But this is not easy. And, and I, I don't want anyone to think it's just, it's just us figuring out how to balance, balance our doggone budget here. That's not what this is. We, 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 we work side by side with you. I will tell you that people in, in, in this room, including um, several of our employees I interface with every single day, who would be adversely affected to some degree by this. And I love them. I mean, I love them. I, I love them like brothers and sisters. So I mean, and just like I love you all. So I, I, don't, so I, don't, I don't want you to think it's, 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 that's not the process. We're trying to work through this in some way that makes sense, but still allow the city to, to, to continue to provide services to everyone who's either here long term as well as meeting the needs of our employees. It's a tough one. We're going to work through it together. But, I, but it's, not, it's not a simply a, a, a penciling exercise. And so you've had your hand up a couple of times. You might come to the microphone? Did he walk Did he go? Did he leave? Did he Where'd he go? Okay, you can come, you can come on up. Do you have a question? No, no. You, you, in, the mean, in the meantime, why don't you, why don't you go up, sir? Then you can follow him. And, Gentleman kept raising his hand back there. If he comes back up, he can, he can, he can go third. Yes, sir. Rusty Smith, retired assistant chief, Columbia Fire Department, 34 years. Good to see you again, everybody. Uh, a lot of people are forgetting I've heard and I've tried to catch to what everybody's been saying. Uh, a lot of people are forgetting the retirees that are extremely ill who cannot go out and get another job. You're talking about eliminating post-65 coverage for all retirees. I got a couple good friends right now that they can't go out and work. I mean, so here, if you go eliminate that and their spouse, they're going to have some problems. I'm, the, I'm speaking up for them. And I've heard what this uh, young lady has been saying about as far as uh, post-65 going out and getting cheaper coverage because there is cheaper coverage out there where if it is, I'd like to know where it's at. Because uh, my wife will be 70 next year, and believe me, we've called around, you just go to and you're looking at four to $600 difference higher. We, we call three or four different companies. So that's what, you know. How much, how much higher, Chief? How much is that? Much it was like four to $600 higher. We even call United Healthcare. And from what, you know, with the city contributing what she's paying, I think she's paying 245 or some odd dollars like that. It was almost $500. You know, that, I'm sorry, that presents a burden. And uh, 
it's eliminating that's going to affect a lot of retirees and a lot of their families, you know, wives, if they got any families left. I got a wife and that's about it. But you go put a real burden on, and I know I understand the city's got a burden, and I've met with Mr. Rickman before years ago. We didn't agree then. <laughs> we don't. We don't agree now. I'm sorry. Well, you don't. Well, I mean, that's unfair. I think that's kind of unfair to say to say that because well, I'm because sorry. you because you, you 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 don't know where we're at. We're in I here don't. working really hard. Yes, and, and I, I'm the one I think who brought up the fact that we ought to be looking at not eliminating post sixty five. Yes, you did. And on that, so, I, I mean, let's be fair. If we let's be fair. You're right. And I apologize for you with you on that. But let's also think about the retirees who cannot get out there and go to work, who have illnesses, okay? And there are quite a few. And if you eliminate that post-65 curse for all retirees, you're going to present them with a big problem. That's all I got to say. Yes, sir. Uh, the, uh, the United Health Care to the mic. It is... United Health Care that we have, uh, can that be renegotiated any? Because I find that United Health Care does not pay much of the benefit or the money to pay. So if I'm wrong on that, y'all tell me, but I get very little out of United Health Care. I try not to be too expensive. I was to go through re rehabilitation, and those people over there was over $1,200 to start off with. I said, no, because I could see where it was going. Well, I just have to go home and do it myself, you know, because I don't want to be that kind of expenditure on the city or nobody else. That's not my nature. You take care of your neighbor. But anyway, is it, can you renegotiate anything with uh, United Health Care and maybe get us a little better situation there or eliminate those folks and... Put it on the other people. It's, I love my active firefighters. I'm ready to die. You know, I made it too. So these guys here, and that's that's the essence of the city is a good employee. We do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We we do look at our post sixty five coverage <clears throat> and try and and work with. Um, the carriers to get us cheaper coverage. But the reality is we have a very small number of people that we're covering, and they have very high expenses. So the insurance companies really don't want to take on that, that responsibility. I don't, I don't know if it's about liking you. I think it's about the dollars and cents of it all because we have a really small population. And when you have a small number, it's more expensive because you have less people, you know, no offense, Pierre, he's an insurance guy, but... Um, you know, it's, it's all about getting in the most participants, and that typically is your cheaper coverage when you have more participants that, that are in your coverage. And, and isn't that kind of the advantage that we've heard from some other folks about getting into to the platform that, the I don't know if it's ARRP, whoever, that has the platform with all, there's like, I think there's like 27 different styles of supplement, because that's what we're talking about here. Right, it's a supplemental. supplemental. Yeah, because they... Medicare is first it's and a foremost to get right. the gap. But, you know, if there is issues with that program, we need to know about that as well as mm -hmm. we move forward. Yeah, um, but it, it does to, supplement to Medicare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Chai, and I'm with the fire department. Um, I just have a quick question of, with the insurance plan set in place right here, how are we going to recruit? How is this a good means of recruiting and retaining employees? Because a lot of people, they might come to see this, and you know, it won't be beneficial to me. I, I give the city 25, 30 years of my life, and at the end of that, I retire. It's I'm just going to the to the wayside. How is this a good insurance plan to retain these good employees on all aspects? Well, if you've given that much service, 
then you should probably be grandfathered into that prior to July 1, 2009. I think, I think, I think he's talking you're about future. Exactly, he's respect. He I think he's saying Well, that's what I was about to say, but you're exactly right. Um, and it's, that's probably the biggest concern. I was listening to Mayor Benjamin and listening to all of the great comments in here, but the people that are truly impacted by what we're having to do or working right now, they're not in this room able to you know, necessarily comment with us right here, right now, because they're working. But the fact of the matter is your retirement eligibility still comes into play too. So that's also what we looked at trying to balance all this. The reality of it is you're going to have to meet that rule of 90. If you, so will you, would you realistically be working for the city 30 years, 25 years? I, I, mean, I don't know. Maybe. maybe yes, ma'am. So. I, I, I completely understand it is a numbers game. But going into, I'm just going to speak, excuse me, speak, speaking biasly, but with the fire and police and other departments in the city, you put your body through a different strain than anyone else you know I've, I've had friends who fell through floors had ceilings fall on top of them the police officers go through a strain you know 25 you know you might start out um, like my co-worker earlier Mr. Huffsettler um, said started out at 18 but in 10-15 years your body is to a 70 year old just about and I just you know I know I just want you all just to reconsider that oh, and I, I will tell you we ask, we're asking ourselves those very same questions, mm -hmm. uh, as not just in recruiting the best, but also retaining the best, mm -hmm. and then balancing that against against just real fiscal realities. And, and, but we ask those same questions, and, and yes. I'll tell you, yes. and they, they never easy to answer. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yes, sir, thank you all. My name is Jeff Dickey. I retired from the police department last year. I'm probably one of the luckier ones because I'm younger and I don't have to come work. So this is actually, I could probably pay nothing. I have two questions. If your defined benefit was set in 2012 when the insurance costs, we saw the chart have gone up, shouldn't the defined benefit go up? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the, the way it was. Um, the way it was um, voted on yeah. was that. The defined benefit would stay the same and that the retirees' premiums would be adjusted to increase right. to Get keep to that DDB 20. the same, which we have not increased retiree um, premiums to the rate that the cost has increased. Yeah. So, so the DDB was like set, that? and we've been supplementing the difference between what the retirees are paying and what the DDB is, and we haven't been maintaining the DDB, actually. We've been paying more than the DDB. The whole what, time. What you're on keeping going forth right now. Well, we one. we looked. We talked about maybe looking at adjusting the DDB. Yeah. I don't know. That might be something that we'll consider. And, and my other question is going back to the twenty years with the city, twenty five with the to be eligible for retirement. What if somebody has their twenty with the city? They're not fifty five, but they can retire under say they get disabled. Say they're fifty two. They've got 20 with the city, haven't met the years, total years for the state, but they can because of disability. Disability would be different, though, wouldn't it? Well, I mean, in, honestly, that's a dilemma that we face, that people face right now. They're, everybody who works for the city doesn't necessarily meet the eligibility for insurance. If they go out, they could have worked here 19 years and get injured, and they got to go out on disability retirement. They're a year short. So we have to make that call every single day. So there are some people who work here, who've worked here 19, 20 years, and they don't get the insurance, depending on when they came in and when they when they leave. But my question is, if they meet the 20 years with the city and they meet the 55, but they can retire disabled, but they, they don't have the 28 with the, with the state program. But if, if they're retirement elig eligible, with the state. whether that's through disability or regular retirement eligible, they'll still be eligible for the insurance. Okay, thanks. Yeah, they just have to be retirement eligible. So if they if they meet all the other requirements, then they could be eligible. I hate to make promises because Lord knows y'all will hold me to them. So I'm speak, trying to speak in broad terms because everybody's situation is different. So I don't want to make a promise that I can't keep. 
Hey, I'm Brantley Hanna. I'm with the fire department retired. I've got a, a couple uh, small questions. I, first of all, I appreciate all the hard work y'all doing. And, and obviously we're frustrated and, and it's very understandably why we, we now have some tighter budgets uh, on the retiree side. Uh, we're down to 53%. I, I heard your note. I've, I've been watching you and you got your numbers right. Uh, half of them. But on the normal percentage when we're working another year, um, that comes out to be an average, what we've averaged to about another 50 to $65 a month for the average employee, depending on where you're at, but I just worked some numbers before I left. That's, that's not enough so far to pay for these expenditures. Um, if, if I have an ex expense right now, if I lower my wife, if I drop her off her coverage right now because she gets a job, I can't add her on. I can't add her back on in two years. And so that's thinking the idea that, hey, if, if my wife has coverage or my dependents have coverage, and they mean my wife, Will we be able to add her back on if she doesn't have that good job maybe in two years? I think that's something we, we've not talked about yet. But as of right now, if I drop her, we cannot add her back on. If I go to a lower coverage, I can never get the higher coverage. Am I right so far? Good. So we want to exceed, but we want to see if we can get all that. So if we're talking about being fair and you want to reward me for being a good, maybe a healthier employee or post-employee, you know, as a retiree, I think it would be responsible to add that, whichever the, the initials were, to carry over. If you're going to give me $1,000 or $1,500, we were talking about would it would it go over? Would there be a cap? Would it get put back in the big fund? Okay. It, it would only be responsible to, because I didn't get kidney stones this year, but I'm going to get them next year. You know what I mean? And so we're only, it's, it's a Russian roulette game. And I think that's, you know, but if, if, we're, if we're saying, hey, part of the new budget is to give him this amount of money, I think it would be responsible to let me keep it out of balance. To, to move forward. To roll it over. <laughs> but if we're, gonna, if we're going to take that, that retiree's wife or, or spouse and put him or her out because they have suitable coverage, whatever that suitable coverage is, we've got to be able to allow them back in if Lowe's, they lose their job or with the state if they lose their job. It's got to be a little bit more of a better system. Here's the last thing I want to say because, again, y'all got a tough job, man. I really do appreciate it. I've been watching yeah, you for my whole career. And the number one word you have always said is your constituents, your constituents your constituents, and now that's exactly who we are. We're not employees of the city anymore. We're, we're y'all's constituents. And so we're actually the people y'all are going to work for. And it's more than just a numbers game, and it's not just as easy, because the whole time when the rates were going up with insurance, that same eight years, we weren't getting raises in the city. It was a huge amount of time. And so so that's just where we were, and that's not to throw stones, but there's a lot of things. That's, that's eight years that we weren't able to contribute more to the 401 or the 457 to get to a point where we can handle these extra fees. The last thing is, is I don't know what it costs to operate um, some of the different departments or to train them in their positions, but I know how much it costs to train a firefighter. I know how much it costs after four months in a recruit school to train a, a policeman in some of the higher, or your architect that Mr. Vine, Mr. Vine was talking about, or your engineers. And when we potentially have a mass exodus of the employees that you have right now, because they're saying, hey, this stinks. This is not what I was in for. You're not, it's not going to happen to the 20-year employee. This only got eight to go. But the guys from zero to ten, whatever that is, I think that should be part of your study. How much extra is it going to cost Chief Jenkins in his budget that he don't have already in the five-year plan that he just tried to add last week saying, hey, we're going to be the best in the city. We're going to be the best over the next five years. But I'm staying lower in here because it's costing me so much of my budget. And, hey, I need more money, which we don't have because we're spending it on health care. There's a lot more parts of the moving parts that we've got to see. And I think there's more parts of the study because there's going to be a mass exodus. I'm telling you, it's coming. That's all they're talking about on Facebook. That's all the young guys are talking about. You know, and is that smart that they leave? I'm not saying it is. I, I'm, I'm not agreeing with them because I want them to have that cushion of a pension one day. We don't have a lot of pensions out there. But for the ones that he said it very clear that can go to the private sector, especially some of the mechanics and some of the engineers, some of the architects, and make more money, you can't sell them on the idea because this is why we're here the whole time. When we loved it, and it was a good job for good benefits. Nobody ever got rich with any of the jobs, including y'all's, in the city, ever. But we always talked about the benefits. And it stinks now because when we get to this age, we can't do as much. Now, I think a lot of that ought to play into it. But when we're talking about how much money is going to cost to train the people that are leaving because of this new plan, and it's not just, I know in the, the first part we said, hey, these guys are not getting charged as much. The active, but they're saying, hey, in, in 25 years, I need to go make me more money so I can invest properly if they do or not. Uh, but I'm going to invest more money so I can handle my health care in the future. Because it's, this is coming again in two years. 
I mean, it's, we're going to be sitting back at the table. But I, 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 I ask you that to consider to try to maybe keep one of the lower statuses or some of the lower stuff. Um, and and you know, there's some great questions in here, what we do with our spouse, what we do with that HRA money or, you know, the accounts. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's coming. It's coming, and depending on what decisions y'all make. Now, y'all got to make decisions. I get it. And, and it's not a tough job. I appreciate your hard work. I really do. I mean that sincerely. But the decisions that are made next Tuesday night over this budget concerning this insurance is going to affect how much of your budget is about to get busted. It's coming. And I think the train is coming down the track. It's just where we're getting off. But I, I appreciate your hard work. I really do. Thank you. Well said. Hey, I'm CO Clark. I've been here since 1982. And when I came, when, of course, the big pitch was I'd never had to pay for insurance in my life. Well, I can understand that. The world as it changes as, it is, uh, as it's going on today. Everything gets nothing but more expensive. When y'all are sitting down and thinking about how <clears throat> we're going to proceed for the employees that come in the future and us, that's, I just turned 62. So I'm a pre uh, 65, but in three years, I will be post-65. So, of course, I'm a little interested uh, in the uh, things that, we're, that you're looking at with the HCA and HRA, excuse me, and uh, things. Will the HA, HRA, will y'all be doing a yearly update on that to reflect the actual cost of any increases uh, as year year, whether it be good or bad? You know, inflation sometimes goes up, sometimes goes down. Will y'all be adjusting that figure on a yearly basis, or is it like the DB, uh, what is it, DBB, that hasn't changed since 2012? What's in the HRA will be what the DDB is, whatever okay. well, that's determined to be. Well, what I'm getting at is if it's 1130 bucks uh, for today, if 20 years... Insurance doubles. Will the H R A still stay the same, or will you reflect the actual in cost and the increases uh, for the health care? We can't raise that, or else it would raise our OPED liability out the roof. And the, 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 no, the numbers would dictate no. That, you, that it, would, it would not adjust, just as we established the defined dollar benefit to keep down those long-term liability numbers. However, just as we're discussing here, this council or future councils can determine otherwise. And, and that, but, but, my, but, but mm -hmm. the, 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 theoretically, the answer would be no. Because if you did, if you did, then you would obviously be increasing that long-term liability. But that's not that this council may change its mind in the future, and, and, and future councils may as well. I'm not envious of y'all at all. Having to make a decision mm -hmm. that area. Thank you. Questions? Good afternoon. Uh, like many have said before, uh, uh, my name is Victor Kemper. I'm a retired captain. Uh, like many have said before, uh, it's a very difficult time. I understand healthcare decisions are are the most terrible decisions. I mean, it affects all of our lives. You guys with health insurance too. You're voting on what what, what to do with your wives and their health insurance and, and things as well. And I understand that. But um, I encourage you to, Councilman Rickman talked about an obligation, to continue to think about that obligation uh, for the, you guys who have come in and fought fire for 20 years ago and now their bodies are breaking down. Um, that there's got to be a way to, fi to find a way to fund health care for them, even if that means um, finding new revenue streams that we've talked about in the past and in the future. Um, I know that um, in the past you've done SCNG's uh, franchise fee or something like that. I don't know how that would work. That's your guys' uh, field of play, you know. But I, I can tell you that as it stands, um, Anna was right, that um, if, if you do change it for active employees or retirees, you'll find that many employees will leave. They'll have no reason to stay. Uh, fire employees um, and police um, have the opportunity to work for a different department without having those 25 years here, or a reason to stay for 20, 25 years, um, they can go wherever, and that means uh, the prisons or anything like that. Uh, 
the same with the fire departments throughout the Midlands and Charleston. We just put out applications. I encourage you to look at those things and think hard. We're the ones who've protected the city for years and we hope to continue to do so. But we have to pick our families first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. All right. Other questions from this bench? I think, too, is. Hey guys, that, I would tell you those questions and answers are very helpful mm -hmm. as well, too. You know, a long they're, list. They're very helpful in those answers. Yeah. Yes, sir. They were very helpful. And, um, you know, we are constantly doing our homework. We'll go back and do some more. And, you know, I, I would say though, that the city is not that much different from other agencies. I mean, you're going to find a gamut of how people are handling um, post-employment benefits and active, and we've been right up there with the, the best of the best. Um, so I hope and pray we don't see a mass exodus. I would venture to say that agencies similarly situated to us are not necessarily going to be this plethora of health care benefits because everybody's facing the same issues we are. Um, but we, we, we hope that's not the case. And sometimes the salary is better for people that live in Charleston, but they live in Charleston. So Correct. the cost of living so is higher every, in Charleston. Everything so you, everything is relative it is. with that. Pays more salary wise. Yeah. The health is better, no doubt. Well, I'm talking about the health care right. costs. So that's well, what the make, issue was about if you leave to get the health care. But you make six thousand more a year if you go to Western County. That offsets the for the moment. For the moment. I think what I'm also speaking of is you got people not just going back to fire jobs or to police jobs, you got people going to find better job better paying jobs. You know, if it's a little Debbie job, or if it's at Michelin, or if it's at other places that might fit some of their goals. Mm -hmm. But in the past, when I first came here, no one would leave. Yeah. And, and the reason that started changing is we started changing some things, and we're like, hey, why are you looking for a job here? Well, it's better out on the other side. And it's not completely better. When they go to change some of those things, you made a comment that was well taken with me. You said, hey, I'd like to think that all those benefits are not just, but they don't know that. They don't know that until they leave and go, and then they sometimes, man, they shouldn't left. But regardless, they left. It, there, it's coming. I'm just telling you, it just depends on, it's coming anyway. Uh, Mr. Rickerman made the comment that people don't stay in their jobs anymore. I mean, I, again, I don't think the average young person understands the, the, the significance of a pension, regardless of how much. I, I yeah. That's it. But That's regardless, true. if they do or don't, it's coming. Yeah. It doesn't matter if they're dumb or if they're smart or if they're great or if they're unadvised or if they're advised. They're still quitting, which is costing the city money in another area when we're trying to save money. And it doesn't matter why they're going or if they're smart or if they're great. What if they're dumb? They're right. still leaving. But our and what can we do to retain them? And, and your plan says, hey, I'm going out and I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Oh, by the way, you got a lot more money. It's going to be cost of you. And I'm telling you, that's a tough thing, especially when they say, hey, I'm going to do all this for this long. Well, part of it's state happens. law rules, too. And again, we said earlier, we're looking at uh, the population and trying to balance it based off who's truly going to be impacted because the, the state law would say now you're going to have to stay. To, so are people really going to do that if you're going to meet the rule of 90, for example? So, I mean, there's lots of things that player other than just because we're going to make this whatever decisions we make right now, it's also about others' decisions that we have to follow to be retiree, retirement eligible. If, unless we say you don't have to be retirement eligible, we haven't yeah. said Yeah, and again, you know, <laughs> retirement eligibility <laughs> has changed Correct. significantly. Yeah, yeah, but Correct. Uh, all, 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 all things being said, that is sage advice. And mm -hmm. I, I just want to I want to encourage you all that we're all having those same conversations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean about employee uh, recruitment, about employee retention, mm -hmm. about um, obligations to retirees, about quality of life, about families. I mean, those these 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 are not um, black and white numbers on on a, on a, on, a, on a sheet. 
we're, we're, we're discussing all those things. And I would say even the, the, the presentation here today is, 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 is a far stretch from, from uh, the different plans that have been presented to us over time. We're trying our best to, to, to take into account all these concerns. But you're right, some of the, some of the long-term concerns mm -hmm. uh, regarding uh, pensions or the possibilities regarding pensions, a lot of our young employees don't think about that uh, <laughs> down, down the road, mm -hmm. and they should be a, a lot more focused on that. Um, but just again, want to make sure y'all know that this is a um, this is a living, breathing discussion, and that, that we're trying to to balance some very challenging global um, um, fiscal issues uh, that that others have decided they're just going to punt on and, 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 and distance them. Yeah. Oh no, a absolutely, and it's helped us. I mean, I, and, and we've had a I, I would tell you we've had a vigorous dialogue uh, uh, amongst uh, council members ind individually and, 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 and collectively, and and. And my guess is we're going to continue to uh, do this from time to time. So, but it's been helpful. It's very helpful. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, the next part of the presentation is uh, regarding the proposed budget. Mr. Mayor and Missy Kaufman, Budget and Program Management Director, will come forward to present the fiscal year 2018 to 2019 proposed budget. Zellos, you got me some love all around the country. Oh. He got a lot of that <laughs> all. <laughs> 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 Okay, but you know, 
Here today, out in the cold tomorrow, too. Yeah, all three of y'all have come and said that to me. I will. <laughs> I should have done it at the beginning. Uh, I could have started from Not in my office, but I'll get them. I did not. I do have some of those healthy cousins. Hold on. I was thinking about that myself. I was thinking about the same thing, damn it. Well, we know, hey, hey, we've been suffering that forever. And, you know, the question comes is, do you agree with me that this is my responsibility or this is my responsibility? And that's, that's going to make the difference. I didn't realize that how much we were suffering. I don't know. I think, I think if we look at that, I bet we could take care of all the employees. Oh, I love that. 100% of that. Do we expect? I think we could. Are we, are we able to say to the employees, these are opposite employees in the private sector? We don't, I mean, we to, don't to have run it. and go work for somebody else. I mean, yeah. private sector is not providing health care. Right. Right. I mean, you know, no offense, but. Yeah.
Lost the audience for this conversation. So, no, that's fine. <laughs> keep moving on. We just want to keep going. Um, today is our our final budget workshop before we have the public hearing. The budget has been advertised, both the budget um, as lo as well as the water and sewer rate um, ordinance has been advertised, and then um, the. Was that not a big ordinance? It's the whole ordinance. It's the whole. Who's got the money? The water and sewer people advertising. Oh no question. <laughs> okay, 
So today we're going to talk about the proposed budget. We'll be talking about the general fund. Uh, then we also have our enterprise funds, which is water, sewer, stormwater, and parking, each three separate funds. Our special revenues include hospitality tax and accommodations tax. We do not have CIP with me, us today, but we'll present you all the, CI, the capital improvement program, which we have a capital improvement program for water and sewer and for stormwater. Those will be ready for you during the public um, budget public hearing for next week. So just to refresh everybody, where we have landed with our budget is the total operating budget of the general of the of the city of Columbia is proposed at three hundred forty six million nine hundred fifty six thousand seven hundred and seventy seven seven hundred and seventy one dollars. Of course, general fund and water and sewer make up the largest. I'm sorry, what was that? General fund and water and sewer make up the largest portion of that budget. Water and sewer is. Um, now exceeding the general fund um, in terms of the largest piece of the pie. As already has been mentioned, this budget has been met with a dose of reality. We're also trying to seek some resiliency in terms of what we're doing going forward and some sustainability. So a number of the decisions and other actions in terms of balance this budget are meeting in both of these areas. Starting with, of course, the general fund. Um, and what we're really doing today is just sort of highlight for you those things that have happened since the last budget discussions. This isn't intended to be a complete overview of the entire budget, um, which we'll be preparing for the public hearing for next week. So the general fund budget is in balance. At this point, it was advertised at $148,101,152. A total of increase of 5.4 million, about 4%. I want to point out that the Largest portion of that $5 million increase, $4 million of that is for the capital improvement program. The capital improvement program is in, originally targeted at $8 million per year, so we borrow $8 million and then we spend $8 million. In the current year, 1718, it was only $4 million. So when we adjust it back up um, to the $8 million, that accounts for that $4 million. If it weren't for that increase in the capital improvement program, the general fund budget would only be increasing $1.4 million. That's less than 1% over the current year budget. Question on that. The, the, um, the, re the reduction. Um, I guess you know, do we, will we know what, what in the capital improvement area is impacted? Of the borrowing? So the general, so you mean, well, the capital, the, the, the program that I'm referring to is a capital replacement program, and that's for our rolling stock. Right. And occasionally we also do a capital, um, some technology upgrades, like when we have to replace our, de refresh our desktops or major heavy equipment. So this, in this case, what we're referring to for the $8 million is our fire trucks, lease cars, gar garbage trucks, um, our, our traffic engineering boom trucks, um, heavy, it's heavy equipment. Um, it's also some investigator cars, so it's the things that it's, and it's just replacement of existing. Occasionally, maybe some new equipment in there, but pretty much it's just to help us retain and or, or be able to um, replace our, our, and upgrade, or keep our fleet refreshed. I'm sorry, I was thinking improvement. You're, you're, you're right. Yeah, so this is capital replacement, yes, sir. Thank you. Of course, the budget was balanced without a property tax increase proposed. Um, it reflects funding to maintain our current minimum service levels. In other words, we are maintaining existing operations. This does not take into account reducing operations, nor really expanding upon, nor um, adding new services. Growth is limited to increased cost for operations, and actually it's even less than what the cost would be in the sense of um, the um, CPI. Um, if you take into account, as mentioned, the, four million, the, uh, the budget increased less than 1% over the current year. The, bu the budget development goals are resiliency, sustainability, and being able to provide quality services that we provide on a daily basis to our citizens and residents and customers. So, you get into this trap all the time. And, you know, no proposed tax increase, but we are having increases. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yes, that's right. So the increase, what, what accounts for the, in other words, the increase is being covered within the in increase of the revenues that we have or by decreasing costs in other areas. Where, where are we 
on attacking the 4,000 parcels? Um, actually, we have a little bit about that where we're going to talk about towards the end of the general fund piece, but we can go ahead and jump to there. I think it's important as we're talking about sure. funding and cost. Right. So um, let me go ahead and just jump to that slide and we can come back. So what we have been talking about, we've proposed a couple of different things with, with you all in terms of some new fees and some other options. What we have found through our discussions is that several of these fees, in order to meet the, the requirements to be a new, a, a, a new fee and not just a tax replacement, is it really needs, to, bottom line is it needs to cover those things for new, for new cost and new services. Mm -hmm. So what we are looking at more is a newer, is is some new programs and new activities that we have talked about with you all with regards to our smart city initiatives, some of the public safety enhancements, some of the expansions of our emergency operations, as well as our general capital improvements and our investments in the in city, city infrastructure. So what um, city manager is proposing is to be able to develop with you a schedule for those continued conversations so that we can bring to you a program that would help us to utilize resources to both for, for either new resources or reprogramming existing resources to be able to implement some of the programs we talked about. Smart city initiatives to be um, is one example, or some of the public safety en enhancements. Couldn't you, couldn't you put, if you call it a smart city initiative, couldn't you put some of the public safety enhancements that we're looking for in emergency operations all under that umbrella? We, Shot spotter. Right. That's, that's what we're that's talking the, about. That's the goal. Yes, that's, that's the goal. That. That's the goal. Would you, um, um, as you're going through slides, if you reference them by number, so Tanika can follow as well. Yes, I'm sorry. So now we are on, oh, the slide numbers have jumped off. Slides are missing. So now we've jumped to the slide that says future discussions on identifying funding. Let me see if I can number it real quick. Numbers are gone now. So back to my initial question, how are we handling those? I think we need to handle those in this budget. Well, it won't be in this budget because part that's to get to what Mr. Duvall is also saying is that those would be for new costs and new expenses. So We're as we talking put about together the existing four thousand parcels, right, and also not the, paying an equal amount, they need to pay a higher fee structure to offset the cost. It is not fair to continue to carry that burden on the homeowners and the businesses. Our commercial districts that are are nonprofits are struggling. You look at a triple net lease today, what it's costing somebody because of the way the tax structure is, and we're continuing to allow this non tax paying base growth. Mm -hmm. So, what are we doing about it? We have no real growth. We have no real growth. So, I mean, our plan this year, we need to overhaul the way we. We do business, and I'm talking about DDRC and all these impediments that are, are, are continuing to, we're getting complaints about. Mm -hmm. But we also need to attack, and we're a government city, and we're drowning by nonprofits. And so they need to pay a fair share, and we need to address it. It needs to happen so, now, not later. So I'm, I would love to have included that in the budget. Um, a couple of the items we looked at, we've also gotten some legal advice on, so that's why I'm looking back at Teresa again, but I think the approach we were taking so that we can you know, do it um, and, and be very you know, careful about how we do it and what we present to you was to take it sort of under advisement and work it into the discussion that you've asked for with your upcoming budget work. Well, they're not budget workshops, but economic development type workshops mm -hmm. and see how we can roll it in. If we do it that way, though, it would be working towards that in the 1920 budget. <coughs> but yeah. now, unless we're able to get a different answer than right. and and it's given yeah. so and also far. The, we need another opinion. Billing it is also going to be an issue. I got a great way. Enhanced water. That was discussed last time. You pay a premium. Last time we had this discussion. What was that? I'm sorry, what was that? The answer? 
So, well, enhanced water service for non tax paying. So, we, we, as we absolutely agree. We just, based on the direction that we have and the information we were given, um, in terms of looking at these fees to be able to cover new costs and new programs, how we structure them is, is really what we're getting at. And so, some of these would be some of the discussions Ms. Wilson's addressed. So, we've talked about the street light fee. We talked about some nonprofit type of um, um, fees, uh, impact fee, or um, we're struggling. We don't disagree, we're especially in terms of we're being struggling. Able to right, please, and we're getting drowned, and you know we got so, is, so everything from Bailey Bill to so have we looked at? I mean, we got a bunch of properties come off Bailey Bill sometime soon too. That's that's a that's we hope. To keep in mind. No, there's no hope where um, they are. The uh, so the staff, uh, as it relates to Daniel's question, have we come up with some different formula uh, as to how we might calculate that going forward? We have we have formulas for one of them at least as we've investigated. One of the other ones more for the nonprofit pieces. Um, we've looked at two different options, and so it's really a matter of having just more discussions with you all. And what were those other ones? Surface area? Or was that, what, what were the other? So some's a surface area. Some is basically um, um, particular types of services. Particular types of services, particular types of areas. To be able to do most of those, you have to have a um, pretty calculated cost of that service and how that service is getting a higher level of service and what's being paid right now. Um, so it's just the different factors that we're looking at, and then in terms of which direction we go, it's a matter of talking to the city council more directly in terms of the directions. Like earlier when we have had conversation, there was maybe not as much of an interest in putting a, a fee on our water bill, but if it's not on our water bill, to be able to look at something more of a, a bill Not on of our water bill, their water bill. Sure. Let's specify that. You're right. That's exactly right. So none of these kind of conversations as we've come through. Yeah. I think the idea to Ms. Ergeman is to not stop. I mean, I don't want right. to think we're slowing down at all on it. Continue to do the research with all the input we need from legal and everyone else, but to move forward with something in place, you know, say by October, so that you're educating the public. You know, if we were to do it now, I think then that's it fine. would be, it I would, just, you know, what July I don't want one, us to do is wait till next. Hey, no, we don't. Fiscal year, wait. because I'm telling you, our constituency, are they're, they're stopped in these guys. I mean, the commercial. You guys don't like to talk. You don't like when we talk about whether it's uh, student housing tax abatement, other tax abatements. The reality is that is that our, our, our commercial taxes, because of, because of residential property taxes mm -hmm. being capped by the ability to affect them, capped by 388, mm -hmm. uh, and the disproportionate amount of property not on the tax rolls here. Vis a vis probably every other city in the, in the, in the, in the state has led to a, a significant and disproportionate amount of tax burden being borne by our commercial citizens. It, it's just real. And, and, uh, and that grows every time uh, the university or the hospitals or anyone else mm -hmm. takes something off the tax rolls or a church mm -hmm. for, that, for that matter taking a, taking a, um, a, a shopping center. Another shopping center. Or, or, yeah. I mean, it's just real. And, I mean, it's not, it's not subjective. It's objective. It's math. And, um, We've got to be thoughtful as to how we address that. So, and I think we, um, I mean, I think honestly, even the previous discussion um, um, well, just underscores this one, just being very deliberate and intentional, uh, and, and coming up with a formula that's, that make, it makes sense, it's fair for all parties involved, right. and let's, let's start discussing it as a body. So we will do that closely. I mean, we've already been working on it, but. I don't want you to think just because it's not encompassed in this budget that right. we're going to slow down at all for any of the information. Mr. McWilliams, <coughs> so the projection, if I understand, the projection then is to push forward and look at 2020. The FY 2019 20 budget. So we'll continue to have these discussions with some workshops with you all, economic development matters, yeah. et cetera. And probably by October yeah, yeah. time frame, you know, have some um, recommendations in place that we could actually implement with the next budget there. cycle. We are not <laughs> the person to stop the business. <coughs> and that was proposed. That's what was highlighted in in your cover memo, Ms. Wilson, in terms of evaluating both 
revenue, just resources in general, whether it's new revenue streams or existing revenue, existing, you know, reallocations of cost in terms of being able to put forth some of these new initiatives. Um, uh, obviously, our goal in terms of being able to sustain this budget is being able to maintain the services we have, but obviously there's a desire, an equal desire to add and grow some of our services and our programs um, and being able to identify the resources to do that with. So, and that's going to take a joint conversation um, with you all for certain. For certain. If somebody could help me out with Ms. Devon, Ms. Devon in terms of the page numbers, I'm going to back up to the revenue slides. I don't know what slide number that is in terms of the complete package because it included the memo as well as the other attachments. I don't know if Erica can see it on the, can you see it on the actual PDF of the your screen? Okay. Missy, I can find Seven. the slide number. If you just say the title, I'll, I'll be able to find okay. it. Okay. This is FY1819 General Fund, and it's the revenue slide. It's got a bar chart. It's page 22 of the packet. So revenue totals for the general fund are proposed at $129.3 million. That's an increase of $2.6 million, or right at 2%. And, of course, the largest increase is in property tax revenues. Um, which are projected at 1.7 million, which is about 3% increase over current year budget. You can see uh, in the terms of the way we've stacked our revenues, um, general fund um, revenue sources, the primary sources are property taxes, and then of course from permits and licenses. Transfers in, the capital lease proceeds is 8 million, um, which increases, um, which is the increase as we mentioned from eight from the 4 million to the 2 million, the, Eight million for the uh, capital lease program, which is our capital replacement program. Then we also have um, the use of fund balance. We've reduced that from three million to one point seven million, and that was also in order to help sustain our goal of sustainability and able to be able to use less of our fund balance, um, which we are also need to make sure that we have the fund ba fund balance be able to meet that through that um, when, our targeted projection 15 percent pardon when will we have a fund balance number that, for for, that, a, for 18 yeah several months after we finish the year yeah. once we can get through the audits yeah so we've already we bid into last year the we've already bid into set aside last year we didn't we, use, we don't have oh you mean excess fund balance. that's right yeah no, we have It's in the package. It's yeah. in the budget package that you have. Yeah. It's in the budget that you have in your package. So with that as well, um, and then too, of course, our 15% target, you know, is based on revenue. So that 15% that target increases every year that our budget increases. Um, So going forward on general fund again, um, looking at the expense side, department budgets total 123 million. Um, of course, as you all know, as we were bringing the budget forward to you, balancing the budget, um, the budget, the 123 million reflects a reduction of 6.7 million in healthcare costs. That's both from plan design changes as well as um, liability changes, and from also the credit we are anticipating to receive from state retirement for the increase in the state retirement system rates. Right now, the department budgets that are before you do not reflect that reduction, depending upon final um, sort of actions on that decision. And so we will adjust department's budget accordingly. We've also eliminated funding in, from the, bu the department requested budget that was, has been presented to you over the past several months. We've eliminated 3.5 million in new requests for department programs and services, as well as an additional 1.5 in requested budgets. So those were primarily the items used that were helping us to balance this budget on top of some of the revenue um, increases that were projected earlier. 
This does include continuation of the city's pay for performance, pay for performance um, merit program of $1 million in the general funds portion. That's for the employees in the general fund. Of course, the other funds have funds in there as well for those employees. Question. Just, um, what is the, uh, are we doing a COLA this year or what? So the proposal is for merit. Yeah, merit. merit. I, I was looking at the uh, salary uh, ranges and differences on the uh, department budgets. It seems like it was uh, relatively modest, so that's. That's correct. Right. And those and numbers every, like. Every department. Is, uh, right. Every department's budget will actually end up going down from what's on your list right now because we once we reflect the changes for health care, but otherwise, um, and health care was primarily the only increase in the department's budget. Um, they, their cost of living was included in the current year budget. So, um, looking at the jail detention, did we ever get the numbers that we requested last October? Which numbers? From, from the county, which... We get the, monthly the information. The former million-dollar director... director had promised us numbers because if they're charging us thirty dollars a day, they're saying that we put twenty thousand people in it's, jail. It's not no. It's it's the no, it's per day per person. So if you're in there for five days, you get that twenty five dollars per person, right? We can thirty dollars. We get a listing every year. Every it's anywhere from as high as low as nine hundred to fifteen hundred. I guess my struggle month. is is we never gotten the paperwork to show what they're charging each entity because they should be charging themselves the same amount because we're all paying equally into for the jail. We pay for the jail with bond that the city employees pay. I mean, the uh, city constituents, taxpayer. And we, we are continuing. I want to see the numbers before we pay them any more money. Every contract that we've had with them, we've been scrutinized and gone painfully through a discussion with them. And never once can we get the jail numbers, even when Kit Smith was on council, and we never could get them. And they were, Howard, you might could get them from them, but the rest of us can't. So we, we don't, you're saying we don't know what they're charging themselves in terms of well, I'm operation. curious, are they charging, or are they just charging the, the other city. municipalities in it? And, you know, that's double taxation. I mean, we just, it's it, five years ago, seven years ago, it wasn't $230,000. It's 600 a day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We will try to get that. Yeah. I don't know who you ask, but. Well, that, that would be good information to me. I don't know. Ask again if you can't get it. Sarah can FOIA it. She'll send us the bill. <laughs> no. I, uh, let's ask again. Okay. Spirit of Regional Cooperation of Wellington. We can share some information that we get to on a monthly basis. Um, so non-departmentals total one, 6 .3 million, uh of that, 1.2 million increase, 23%. The large of, the, of that being the proposed increase for the debt service payment, or the, the payment for the capital lease program. Um, the current year, the, we've maintained current funding levels for external agencies, which includes the Alvin Escalin Detention Center at 600,000. That's the current amount um, in this year's budget. We increased it in the current year to reflect their increase in the per um, inmate per day rate um, in the current year, and so far we're able to sustain that amount. Public defender is a hundred thousand. The solicitor is in at two hundred fifteen thousand, um, and then the homeless services maintained it at one million, which of course that includes four different contracts that the city supports with it with those funds. Transfers out total seventeen point eight million. That includes 3.2 million increase. Uh, again, 4 million of that is for the, or 8 million of that is for the um, capital replacement program. It also includes our debt service payments and transfers to the component units. Um, I do want to point out that, again, this year in the budget, there is no funding for capital improvement program for the general capital project. 
Um, we've already discussed the dis um, additional resources. Next is uh, talking about affordable housing. Uh, City Council in January adopted affordable housing program. It was estimated that about 350000 would be um, from the general fund. What we're proposing is that we would use a portion of uh, yet-to-be-determined um, savings from this fiscal year, should there be any for that towards that funding. In the interim, there are funds being used from other grants um, to help fund. Can we do an SSR program. credit for housing? Commercial, if it's commercial, we should. We could, we should. I mean, I mean we keep talking about putting family? money in these things. Why aren't we creating that same atmosphere? Oh, I, oh, I, I, I think we should. I think the exact same approach we're taking with student housing, we should take to affordable housing. We ought to be able to, we ought to give folks. Incentive. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, it's still skin off our back because obviously we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, 100% of nothing versus uh, a portion of something. Um, we, we could do that on the it's, we have a the, 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 the that, was, that was included in the, that was included in the memo I sent to everybody last year. Yeah. Okay. We need to also still get the county the school district. Yeah. Well, that's why, that's why we, have, we need to figure out how we can do that. Like you do a multi-county. Mm -hmm where it's just the county, we're not getting that discussion, they pay the full rate and then we credit them back. And then that way it's it's an easy, clean deal and everybody understands it. The thought, the thought, the proposal before was to incentivize mixed use, mixed income housing. And if we did this commercial, then yeah, it would qualify for whatever tax abatement we had attached to it. If it was a 50% for 10 years or what have you, but try to really aggressively go after um, you know, what we want, not what people want to give us. And I think you create that environment. I think you'll see the same type of, because uh, especially. If you make you them pay the 6% mm -hmm. and you credit it back, then they actually got to deliver. And, the, and, the, and then they'll also get the, um, potentially the 4%, you know, um, right. zone, um, uh, uh, program through state housing. I mean, it, you could really, let's just, let's just create a tool and, and just put it out there and see what happens. We, we wind up. Yeah, with, this with is what more, we can do. Here yeah, it is. yeah, yeah. I mean, and again, it's, and it's no money out, out, of, out, of, out of our pockets. We just create the environment and see what the market will bear. I think people rush in with with, with housing. We can incentivize the sixty percent of for um, um, uh, six percent um, to one hundred twenty percent AMI if we want to. I mean, so you so you got you capturing you know working families all the way up to you know to you know ambitious young professionals or what have you I, again that that was that was in the mix um, last year and the goal the thought then was let's let's see if we can incentivize it heavily in uh, all across the city I mean that's so not so we're not concentrating in, in in one district let's see if we can find four four areas and all across town and you, if, if you tell people what you want and what yeah. you're willing to incentivize not just what they want to bring, then I think you wind up with with much nicer product, and and, and it'll be borne by the private sector, not by the public sector. And that's I'm the super, Excuse me, Senator McCoy. Right. That that's the difference between doing the student housing abatement versus what you're talking about. Us coming up with areas that we want developed and the type of development we want. And incentivizing that, I can go with that. I can't go with well, well, that. Well, well, that was on. I'll we put it back on the table again. Uh, I, don't, I don't mind. Let's, let's refresh that memo. Uh, but the you know, it's important to note that the first round of student housing when we did it a couple years ago, while it may not have been location specific, it was very specific in what we were willing to incentivize in terms of the amount invested, in terms of, in terms of design and, and, and uh, uh, review and, and the like and I mean it was it was very specific it was not location specific mm -hmm. uh, but um, but no I think I think again it, it's it's telling people what you want and, and, and not making it overly restrictive so that uh, there there's, there's there's no opportunity to, to earn profit there so the private sector doesn't want to come there but let's let's build a build a mousetrap and get the heck out of the way and let's see what the private sector will bear yeah um, I, I had a guy that called me last week Said that he's got, I think they're federal dollars for um, affordable housing, and um, I think also they were looking at um, um, 
single family models, the mix includes rent to buy. You know, that's that's kind of <laughs> iffy sometimes. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But everything else I'm I'm seeing out there on the on the uh, internet is a lot of these cities are are in fact looking at affordable housing, mixed income, and also um, <clears throat> they're using it as as one of the uh, launching pads for redevelopment. It's, t it's really tied in, not just housing, but a, a redevelopment plan, a redevelopment strategy for uh, parts of cities and municipalities that need and are struggling with redevelopment. Mm -hmm. So I think if we do that, that that's the way to go for me, for me and, I, and that's kind of what I'm hearing out there. Um, people don't say it to us. Going back to what some of our weaknesses are and how we're struggling, they don't they don't say it, but they they, they see it and they recognize it, and they're kind of wishing that we do do something about it. You know. Missy, on, on so your, I'm on board with that. But. On your slide there, you talked about taking <coughs> the 350 that we don't have in the available in the general fund, but maybe the funding you talking about just that 350 with savings on the health plan, or are you talking about all the savings on the health? All savings on the general fund budget at the end of the year, right. not just health care savings. Like once we complete the year, fund balance, we'll use of fund balance. A, we'll okay. Surplus. Right. okay. And you come, and with, you come with, you come with an incentive. First item. And you come with an incentive and you sunset it on day one, and it's a good incentive, you'll, you'll find some activity there. Mm -hmm. So can I just mm -hmm. add to the discussion yeah. on SSRC? Because if we're going to do something like this, because we are 17.9% of total tax money, we will really need the county and the school districts as a partner. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have to have a discussion with them because together. housing, it depends. You know, when you talk affordable housing with them, they have said recently that's a big priority of theirs, but when we dis had discussions a year ago when Ryan and I met with them to talk about something similar to this that included parking and with it, the, the feedback we received was is they weren't interested in doing this with housing. They're interested in doing it more for commercial. So has that changed? I don't know. Rain Living would indicate at least it's changed for someone over there. Um, <laughs> but those are the, for this the county. So those are, we're going to have to start those conversations and really bring them in. Well, I don't think it's fair to use that as an example because we all know that there's another incentive behind that. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do with the savings on right. health care? For the eight, um, 1718 budget. That's, there, there are no savings in the 1718 budget. The changes we're making now don't go into effect until January 2019. 1819. Yeah. Uh, okay. 1819. That would be this. That's what helped balance. Remember, we had, the budget was $15 million shortfall. And you're going to make that up by the, the savings in the Combinations of the health care. Re reductions to department's budgets and revenue adjustments. Okay. So, so the savings in the health care have already been programmed into this budget. Yeah, well, the, the, the health care is because of reduction of liability and costs that you're... Correct. It's both costs... You don't need to say the way it's being stated. Right. Yes. Right. Correct. Right. We're not reducing health care. Yeah, you're not reducing health care. We're not reducing health care. Savings in the cost. Okay. Any other questions on the general fund? Okay. All right, so next we have our enterprise funds, starting with the water and sewer budget. Um, water and sewer budget is 106, the revenues are 160 million, 167. Um, the actual total water and sewer budget is 161 million, but those are the actual revenues for operating revenues. Um, and it does include a rate adjustment of 9.76%. 
In terms of our department budgets, 71% of the budget is for our utility operations. That includes our water and wastewater crews. That includes our plant operations, um, both, wa both water plants, both wastewater treatment plants, um, and as well as the um, activities spent on those um, services. Outside of our department budgets, the next largest item would be um, for debt service, which is 22%. So the total, the, out of the total budget, 58% is for our um, utility operations, our total department operations, and the next would be de debt service on the capital improvement, on the uh, bonds for the uh, water and sewer capital improvement program. Again, the budget is proposed at $161.9 million. It's an increase of $9 million, or 6% over the current year. It does reflect a rate adjustment of 9.76%. It maintains the, F, the capital improvement program for water and sewer as $120 million. That includes um, $21.5 million that would be funded from cash out of this budget. The remainder would be coming from bond proceeds. Of the capital improvement program, $80 million is programmed for wastewater improvements, and $40 million is programmed for water improvements. Okay. What's left on the water improvements? What's from left? That, yeah, from the descent decree. You mean the, uh, you know, the wastewater? Yeah, because no. What water? <coughs> you know? Water was $150 million and the balance of it was wastewater from the descent decree. Um, if I'm understanding your question correct, you're asking how much more investment we need to to get out of our consent decree. So um, the latest projection we've got, the $750 million figure that was ballparked when mm -hmm. we got into it, is about where consent decree driven, that's where we're projecting to end up. Now, we're making other investments as we need to above and beyond. We have to. Consent decree requirements are. So um, I don't have the figure of how much is left, but but that outlook over the 10-year projection is looking like it's going to be in the ballpark and, and relatively correct. We're about to embark on a fairly aggressive, um, even more aggressive uh, program of capital improvements in our collection system. Mm -hmm. That's where our next big spend is going to be. We're... We're in construction with some big projects at the wastewater treatment plant, digester upgrades, stream one aeration, NPDES permit compliance type. Um, but a lot of our major assets, we have done the condition assessment and inventory. We're developing that list of priorities and we'll be rolling those projects out. And our early cost estimate for those in the spend moving forward is over the next five years, 80 million a year on the wastewater side. Um, and then reducing down, I think we showed that last time, reducing that number down a little bit. Does that answer your question, Frank? Mm -hmm. Okay. Moving on to our stormwater program. The stormwater budget is, um, of course, the revenues from the stormwater system are, are, fund, are funded from the stormwater fee. <coughs> the expenditure um, for that is uh, Public Works makes up 30% of the budget. Engineering is 22%. We now have in this budget um, debt service and reserve since the new program to um, invest in, um, in the capital improvement program of $93 million over the next several years. With Engineering is 100% based on our stormwater plan, 22%. 22% of, of, the, of the department, in the engineering department. 22% on the budget funds... Is, is the engineering department staff is the program from the engineering budget that includes the go ahead I'm sorry but in our engineering department that houses our stormwater compliance our MS4 compliance program so that stormwater group yeah, thank you Miss that, that stormwater group is housed there. So the budget for stormwater is $13.4 million, an increase of 836 or 6.6% .6 over the current year. Um, the capital improvement program for this year is $10.3 million, um, with a total projected CIP of $93 million over the next three to five years. Um, as you are aware, the stormwater program manager was um, contracted for in March. 
and the bond ordinance was approved in April of 50 million. So this program is uh, helping to fund that program moving forward. The stormwater fee that was adopted last year will increase 74 cents per ERU, which is the equivalent residential unit. So the rate will go from 11.80 per month to $12.50 per month. That's for typical residential unit. Of course, commercial is on a um, ER is ERU based on their um, impervious area. Okay. Next is our parking fund budget. Um, the total parking fund budget. Um, majority of those revenues come in from street meters. Um, actually, garages and lot makes up 39%, and then our street meters makes up 34%. And then non-moving violations are 25% of that budget. Expenditure-wise, it's split about 37% for parking services and 33% is debt service. And then parking facilities is 17% 17 of that budget. The total budget is proposed at $8.6 million, which is an increase of $684,000 or 9% over the current year budget. Um, revenues from parking garage and lots, of course, make up the majority. Um, there will be included some scheduled paintings of the garage, some barrages, as well as continued improvements um, in customer service and continuing to partner with our economic development areas to attract businesses to downtown. Next, we have our special revenues, um, starting with our hospitality tax budget. Hospitality tax is proposed at $12.1 million, which is an increase of approximately $557,000 or 4.8% over the current year. Um, revenues projection, revenue collections are in line with current year projections, so we are feeling pretty confident about that 4.8% um, increase proposed for next year. The budget that is given to you right now just reflects the current amounts by each of those different categories of um, the amount that's funded for um, the hospitality tax committee, the amount to the line item agencies, and then the amount to um, Previously, previously approved um, allocations from city council. We've not made any indications about how much you may want to move around within that budget for those areas, other than, of course, debt service and then the transfer to the general fund of $3.7 million. And again, some of those allocations are already pre-approved. They were approved by council earlier. So at this point, it's just a matter of the budget allocation. Um, I think we're still needing some direction from city council with regards to how we actually disperse those funds or how you actually want to disperse those funds. The committee recommendations have been made, but I asked um, Erica to, we won't see them on your draft agenda for the 5th, I think. Maybe we need to get that this feedback and put them on for the 19th. The committee recommendations for April. Are we having a follow-up discussion about age tax? We are, but it won't be before you at the... You know, so, well, I mean, you know, I got questions. Let's <laughs> <laughs> don't have it this afternoon. I got to have the end of the <laughs> six. <laughs> yeah, some of these, and, and it's just simple autos, but I mean, I think that, you know, think before we we move forward and I, I know there's a push to try to do but I mean I think we really got to decide on how this money is spent you know what these groups I mean I, I've looked through and I've highlighted some reimbursables that are questionable and that we paid um, most of the 990s aren't up to date and we're allowing them to get money I just I, I, we've got to change the system well, Dee's been working really hard through the committee process, and as she's worked through that, I think she's found even more recommendations. So, I was trying to give her time to get through that, put all her recommendations together, and have a work session discussion on it. So, timing-wise, you know, obviously some of the bigger discussions do sit around these line item agencies. Well, you know, they're all going to be lined up here January, uh, July second. Looking for a check. Well, I would help. your preference be to have the discussion on June 19th or in the work session? Me. Suits me. I mean, I'm going to ask uh, Dee Dee to pull some more stuff because I just think we, as we have this discussion, we got to decide what the guidelines are because it seems to be a little loose. 
you know, and if we're going to make changes, I think Howard has some suggestions that he would like to implement. And, you know, I think we also got to decide, I mean, does this become the clean and safety fund, you know, or does it become, you know, we push them to grow and, and sure. what are the accountabilities that we're holding people to, not just on the reimbursable, but deliveries. I mean, they're supposed to help increase the pot. And the reason the pot's increasing now is because we're having more restaurants open and open. So my, I guess my question for you all then, just for, for the sake of direction, we can, we can pull together the presentation from the June nineteenth work session, and then you could. You were about to talk about your summer calendar, but you could either put them on for the evening meetings, committee recommendations, if you're trying to do that that quickly or we could do the I was going to push your work session on HPAC more into the August time frame and just let you make your recommendations of you know well, how do we do now. that for funding because they all look for funding I mean once July well, that's what I was comes. saying you I wasn't necessarily going to assume you were going to factor in any changes for this round well, I mean, I of approvals. Know. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to discuss. So if you're if you're talking about discussing it before you approve these, I, I, I'm not going to vote for the H tax the way by okay. just funding a group that we haven't really set out some guidelines on. Um, then we would in need your to leadership, be more aggressive. You've been sitting with the committee folks. No. Where? What about the um, um, the outline, the, the recommended? Structure that we discussed. Well, the Whitehead Mr. plan. Mr. Rickman has different opinions of that, and I think we need need to have uh, a work session to let us debate where the council wants to go on it. Um, well, between the two of you, I'd, I would <clears throat> I'd like for us to do that a little sooner than later, because you know I'm right here anytime you want. We. We're approaching the point where dollars are going to be recommended or <laughs> divvied out. And, On both sides. Yeah, and so <laughs> I, some of those um, concerns I still have, and um, I would be interested in seeing which, again, um, entities are yeah. honestly getting what they requested and those that are requested and getting nothing. Well, I, I think... Council needs to. There, there's a difference of opinion on the administration of the age tax, and we probably need to have a work session to work that out. Right, and, and so my only question was, do you have that work session before you vote on the committee recommendations that are before about to be before you, or do you make your just make your way through the committee recommendations that are about to be before you, so that they are not held up until. August time frame, and then have your work session in August. I think everybody wants to have them before we okay. grant. So if that's the case, then we're looking at probably the next council meeting realistically because we're about to talk about your summer schedule where you're, you're not meeting in July. So if you don't want to... Okay, well, I'm going to need a little guidance then on how you want to handle that. So if you want to meet in, if you want to have your work session on HTAC, then perhaps you can have that as your work session in July. And then vote on your well, committee recommendations. I, I know that a lot of people don't want to meet in July, but if we can get four people together and have a meeting, that maybe does a consent agenda and whatever uh, routine things that we can do that night just to meet the requirements of the law. I'm sure there's four of us that'll be in town. Okay, well, I've gotten lots of different feedback on that as far as your <laughs> schedules go, so well, that, that's next on your agenda, so I don't want to jump ahead. Um, but I guess if you want us to move forward with your work session item, we can squeeze it into the June 5th 
work session. It, the June 5th work session has gotten pretty tight, but I can maybe move something off and put I'll be phoning in. Well, let's don't do it when you phone it in. You need to be sitting at the table for that today. I'm just, I'm, I'm out. There's nothing I can do about it right How about now. the 19th? I'm here the 19th. I'm here the 11th. I'm just out the 5th. Okay. How about the 19th? And that's fine. I thought what I was hearing is that you wanted to vote on the recommendations too. So is it realistic to think you would work through your discussion of guidelines and all that during a work session and then vote on the spreadsheet that evening? You're good with that? I wouldn't even think about it. <laughs> I don't know why we couldn't. I mean, I think part of the questions I have may be that create some internal, you know, how do we, how do we approve Fourteen hundred dollars worth of gifts, gift cards, on a reimbursable. To me, I don't understand how that happens. You know, how how are we dishing out this money? And and I think we need to have that conversation. Is it real ambitious? And, and I mean, grind it out uh, if you want next week. It'd be nice. It'd be nice to have. Eight stacks, um, not before us. You know, for the better part of July and August, like it has been in the past, I think we would get it done. But we have some certainty. If we could, we could be. We can grind it out. I'm not sure how we do that with uh, Daniel um, may not be in the room, and it also may just require some you know, clear articulation of, of, what, of what the rules might be. Um, again, and then of course making sure we have some enforcement of those. Is, is there a possibility of having another meeting in June, like today's meeting, where we just have a work session in the afternoon yeah, when yeah. Daniel's going to be around? Yeah, I would say June and July are both very difficult for me. Uh, and most it's, people uh, it is. Yeah, and um, I'm not saying it's impossible, but as far as working, it just seems to me it's just not getting done. I mean, done. I don't it's mind being on the phone. That doesn't bother me. Um, I think we can... Push through it if y'all have the you know, wherewithal to go. I just think we've got to dedicate create, the time on the 19th. We've got to create a, a clear line of how this money's supposed to be spent and what we expect of it from people. And that's not necessarily going to impact your, and it may or may not, your decision. Decision making on the committee recommendation may not at all. So yeah, absolutely, it but it may. it may. It may. I don't know. But your guidelines that you talk about say you do it on the nineteenth, and we have the committee recommendations on the agenda that evening. But I think it's important that we don't give any uh, even committee money out if their paperwork's not up to date. You can't be two years behind on nine. Not when you're getting. I think June 19th. June 19th afternoon. Uh, the committee to I don't know what yeah. That's our so regular here, meeting. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Get on the 19th and right. everything on the. Come in two day. hours back, early. Let's just come in now. Thanks for snacks. Let's do it. I think you definitely can do it. I guess what I was trying to make it's sure it's you I wasn't understanding you to say that. Based off whatever guidelines you come up with in the work session, we would need to have then 19. gone through the committee backup material to see if those decisions, you know, the recommendations are impacted by, if you're saying, you know, gift cards are at the expense when someone has done that. I mean, we're not going to literally have the time to have gone back and given you any guidance on the I mean, we, committee's you know, recommendations. I, I think it could be clear because, I mean, I think it, then it becomes part of our role in the reimbursable. I mean, we shouldn't be paying for workers' drinks. That's the same thing the penny t sales tax people were trying to scam. That's, that's not, you know, we're not buying Mountain Dew and water for your workers or toilet paper. Well, well we, that would be the going forward on the reimbursables. Again, if you all see the recommendations and you what you normally do and decide that you're going to fund things or not. That's I think we could do it. going forward on how we the funding is only, yeah the funding is only based on what they actually the amount they the what they are allocated is different than what they may get reimbursed based but on what's submitted. We have eligible. To, 
we have to agree one right. way or another because we, we, we need to Howard's what the parameters are. Yes, um, recommendation so, is different from that. So, so, so yes, we need to agree on what the parameters are. We need to enforce those going forward, um, and obviously we all always maintain the prerogative of looking of, look, of looking back and and you know how we, we treat applicants accordingly based on, on right. prior decisions made. We need to do that, but yes. We can climb the hill. Right. <laughs> okay, no problem. L L lengthy discussion on the nineteenth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, so final final budget we have for you is the accommodations tax, and it's proposed at two point five, almost two point oh. six million. Um, <laughs> it's approximately three hundred sixty nine thousand, or sixteen percent increase over the current year. <laughs> The accommodations tax, of course, the majority of the hospital, the accommodations tax, 95% of it is allocated, to, or 30% is allocated for advertising and promotion of tourism. 65% is allocated for tourism and related expenditures. We've not, of course, made recommendations specifically how those funds would be ex expended to the two groups that typically receive those funds. Um, as far as the 5% general fund purposes, or general purpose funds, um, which you, you have used previously to find um, One Columbia, a portion of One Columbia, as well as the Together We Can Read program. And of course, $25,000 is an automatic transfer to the general fund, and that's based on, that's the first allocation straight out of the state law. Any questions about accommodations tax? The last item is just mentioning the budget as discussed. Next week is the budget public hearing, first reading, and of course our, our open house where we will have departments presenting um, information about their services and programs that they provide. That will be June the 5th. Public hearing is scheduled for 6 p.m., the 6 p.m. meeting rather. Second reading, June 19th, in which you've just now added additional items for discussion. June 19th will be the second and final reading. Thank you all for your patience and diligence and commitment to this process. Digging deeper into the presentation a little bit between now and then. But thank you. Thank you all. Good job. You're welcome. Thank you. Has Pam got, yeah, Pam, you got your list of things to review before? Then you might have more, but the, the couple of things I had was uh, looking at the possibility of removing spouse coverage in the um, current workforce if they had creditable coverage. And the retirees. If they had coverage. Okay. And mm -hmm. I think the uh, captain of the chief, retired chief, had a good question about spouse coverage if a spouse has creditable coverage and then for some reason loses credit creditable coverage do you bring them back can we bring them back right now we last year we changed was it last yeah last year we changed it the start of this um was it last the year before yes so starting in 2017, we, we made a change that you all voted on that would, once they go off, the, once they leave here, they have to keep the plan that they have, and they can go lower, but they can't go higher. And they have to, the people that are on their coverage when they leave, then that's, those are the people that they can keep, they can't add. And we were the reason why we were doing that is because a lot of people were getting married and they were adding people after they were retired. Um, some of them adding people because they were sick and they were at, seriously. So we were like, you can't just add people kind of willy nilly. Um, 
So if they had a spouse when they left and they got a new spouse, they, I guess you could sw <laughs> switch your spouses. But that's the reason why we made that change. I well, mean, if y'all want to make change, change it again. They can. They can. Well, I mean, I think the question, the question comes down to is if, if the spouse leaves, and let's say in five years she's worked somewhere, she's had insurance with them, they don't, she doesn't have any more, she gets laid off. Let's say she works at a big utility that goes out of business. <laughs> In the middle. Well, I mean, you know, let's say everything. I mean, really, honestly, because it gets down to eligibility rules and everybody's, there's always a circumstance. I deal with it every single day of my life. Somebody's got some circumstance that we have to be careful that we do something it. consistently. What, what would be our general rule on that, Linus, looking at? That you can't come back. Again, when, when you all made back. the change in 2017, it was that. Whatever coverage level they left with, they could go lower, but they couldn't go higher, and that they could not add any additional dependents after they left. So hypothetically, any anything can happen. I mean, I'd love to create a rule for everybody, but you know, it gets to where we have to kind of manage this whole thing. Well, the big one for me would be to see what impact removing spouse coverage from the existing employer would have. Okay. It's a, you know, it's just an interesting, um, of course, there's several sidebars I have here, and um, it's usually, it usually precipitates a pretty decent back and forth between Mr. Duval and Ms. Devine when we start talking about spouses and, and family coverage. You know, we, I, I appreciate it, first of all, appreciate the work that staff's done with our consultants appreciate the discussions that councils have amongst ourselves regarding health insurance. I really appreciate the input of our employees and retirees. I found it edifying and, and, and passionate, but still helpful. And, you know, and I felt even better that all the situations that were brought up to us, we contemplated in our, in our own discussions as, as well, <coughs> having a well-rounded discussion. But uh, we, we do need to spend a lot of time looking at uh, – the consistently evolving nature of healthcare coverage, the constantly sh shifting sands uh, uh, of, of exactly how you provide long-term benefits to, the, to your employees, and again, continue to refocus our efforts on our employees, on our employees and our retirees. Let's look at the, the entire package, but obviously our long-term uh, responsibility rests with the people, the men and women who, who work for us every single day. And I, I don't, it's not onerous to, to, to ask a, a spouse if you have optional coverage somewhere else to, help, to use that coverage as opposed to our well, it's not a, it's, it's not even the, yeah. It's not even the, just the coverage. Mm -hmm. It's that we have been supplementing a spouse to almost the level of what we supplement an employee. Yeah. And that's part of what's not sustainable. So if you and had, had, you know, gentleman who spoke earlier his wife has been able to do that for 40 years if we had all of that funding back in we may not be having this discussion mm -hmm. yeah. something to think about but our obligation is to them you're to right them, to them, not to, to and and I think this the process that we've gone through um, has shown that that's our focus so thank you all other items that um, you all to recall from the discussion that we need to research? Have you given us that thing printed out? Or is it all electronic? Yeah, I'm speaking. Let me go. Yeah. <laughs> you put it all up there. I need to make sure that my list is yeah. the right list. The other, the other items that I noted... Um, you know, just some clarifications about pre-existing conditions and disabilities. The retirement. Um, Getting if some the, real clarity. If the account can carry over the funds, if that's just a decision we let's, have to let's, make let's or look, not. Let's look, at, let's look at the numbers. And I mean, and maybe, and maybe they, yes, they can carry over maybe uh, maybe for a period of time, maybe year to year, or maybe two years, whatever it happens to be. Um, I mean, I think there ought, there ought to be some, mm -hmm. some ability that, that – 
to hedge that liability if I'm not sick this year, but I am sick next year, uh, but but not not in perpetuity. Was the consensus regarding post sixty five coverage um, to move forward with the HRA account for that group? And to keep the DDD for the post sixty five. Mr. Reagan, we should have combined the two the HRs the HRAs into one HRA. Are you trying to say active? You said post. You said post sixty five. Retirees and the salary post sixty five. Do we keep the post sixty five group and then hand them over DDD? No, we look at HRA account. So HRA, but it's a DDD. It's still a DDD, so right? The HRA at three hundred dollars is what they're paying for what their DDD is. Question is, is it every retiree in the system or is it those folks that are in it as of December thirty first and then that goes away? Well you have to draw the line. I mean we can't we can't provide benefits for the future at this point. New new hires would not have that opportunity. When they turn post sixty five. Population as it is that was presented. That's, I mean, that's what we're asking. But those are the questions we have to answer when council's here. I mean, not everybody's here. That's a discussion point. That's so the population we've talked about now includes everybody hired before 2009. That population, what was presented, did not include a, pre a post 65 suburb. Right. So now we're saying post 65 would continue for existing retirees in the plan. Obviously, new enrollment drops December 31st. Right. So if you're not enrolled by but December 31st. Currently in the plan. And, and, and you weren't hired before 2009. Yep. No, no, no HRA. Correct. No That's my understanding. Okay. What about the um, age requirement? I'm sorry. I was asking you a question. What was that? The age requirement, the 55. Is that something you guys want to? That, that, that just reflects what, I mean, kind of, mar mar kind of marries it up to state law rule 90, right? I mean, is that what we're No, right. that's just our own. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It's not as aggressive 55, as rule 90. 55. Rule 90 is a lot more aggressive. 50, so is there 50, 55, 35, is that right? Yes. That's the rule of 90. Right, 55, but 35 would be the rule of 90. We have a, I mean, we have several folks who can retire fairly young, so that was just a thought of we're adding that, but I do see the, you know, there's going to be some angst with that one, adding the age. For folks that we've at, we were basically saying we're going to honor the, if you were here prior to 2009. But then we're adding another caveat on top of it. I mean, back then when when we said that you would get retiree insurance through the city prior to 2009, there was no age requirement attached to it. It's just if you age of 20 years, then you would get it. And so when we as long as it was available. As long well, yeah. as I, I mean, you were, well, I mean, we you were retirement that's eligible as well. I mean, you had to be retirement right. eligible. Right. Correct. You had to be retirement eligible. Yes. That's why. That, but that, any of this, you times. have to be that's retirement said, eligible. Several well, times they never, it didn't make any sense to me that we would make lifetime obligations to someone at 39 years old. Uh, uh, no, they would have to be retirement eligible. 38 years old. Okay. Right. They have to be but retirement eligible. But there are some people. But there are some people. Oh, certainly. Oh, certainly. Absolutely. Yeah, there absolutely. are some people who are really young when they're retirement eligible. Would be, would be retirement eligible. Mm -hmm. But you know, that, like that goes back like to the question the is, is right. if they can get credible insurance from their other thing. Because, I mean, in today's world, no it's, nobody's going to retire at 47 and I'm never out work another day. Ain't going to happen. Not work. That's what she said. There's no the way. <laughs> Well, I don't be working know. I mean, 88. That was her example anyway. And so there may be other examples like that. And I want to reality of it here. is something different. That that I guess
guess what I'm conveying to you is at July 1 of 2009, prior to that, the rule was if you're retirement eligible and you served the city for 20 years, you would get the pension that was in a time of You'd have the opportunity have to get insurance. You don't get it if you don't have it. Well, yeah. Huh. That's with <laughs> all of clarify. us. That goes without saying with everything we're talking about. But I think we're adding on the age requirement. The age requirement back then wasn't, there was no age requirement. So what, I was just trying to explain to y'all why how much that, how they much were. That population, how much is that population? Largest what population? That we guessed. Oh, so that we guessed it would fall into that into that number of those who were here pre-2029 would not be retirement eligible by state standards, but would also still potentially exceed the 20-year um, threshold. Yeah, I don't know. See, I mean, we can look at what cover it. No, you can we can look at the time. Bucket of a bucket. So just right, and we can look at the time people have with us, but we we may not be capture able to capture else. all of their else. other eligibility because sure. they could have worked for a state agency. They could have sure. worked anywhere else. <clears throat> people meet eligibility at different, so different points. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. so many different points. Everybody's situation is different. Made a change before. Right, right. The other mark is, of course, the 2014 state requirement, which I'm not sure if a lot of current employees have how much they register. That was before we even had this. Um, well, nobody registers well, it until so they get ready of, to retire. So it's a matter of, <laughs> so in other words, it's a matter of what, where do you want to draw the line of demarcation? If we're going to draw the line. And keep in mind, no matter where we draw that line, somebody's five not stories exactly up there and tell you all like they did today. That's yeah. just going to happen no matter what. Uh, if we change to 55 and it goes away, there's still someone that came in on July 2nd, 2009 that's going to say exactly. Oh, if I had to be here so the day before, no we, I draw line, we just need to know there is a group of somebody that's going to be right at that edge that's going to come up and. Always. We'll never be able to cure I mean, But I guess what the council is asking, though, is it enough of a pot? I mean, is it the, is the savings going to be that much of a difference? I mean, because it wasn't a requirement. It wasn't before 2009. So if we add that on, what are we accomplishing by doing that? Was it something that we might add for the future? That, is what, that was part of the calculation of what the liability was going to be. I can't tell you what that for future, for our future liability, yes, mm -hmm. by changing it to fifty five, because he also had us change it. He bumped up one of the options, which because we did the fifty five, was just bumping everyone up two years as well. So there's a dollar amount to it. I don't know what that amount is. Um, yeah, but, but he we, did that before we went back and changed and added the two thousand nine. Did he not? I mean, the age thing wasn't. We the came up thing, with this. The age that thing was before the 2008. Right. Because we had already, he, uh, Eric had already, one of the, one of the um, options, 3B, well, three. Three. Two, 2, 3, and 3B added the age requirement. And it added an additional two years of eligibility requirement. Which we didn't add. Right. Which we didn't add that. So if you had to have 25 years, you'd have to have 27. If you had to have 28, you'd have to have 30. So we didn't we didn't add that plus the age. And I think part of what's also, our, there's two different pieces of this decision. One is the maintaining the duty rule. That was really the first decision that we had to make. And that's what the council was doing is we maintain that DVD. Because then after that, then it's a matter of, okay, then what do we do with that DVD? So the option that we've, the path we've gone on is maintaining the DVD through an HRA. If they were to maintain the path of staying on the city's insurance covered under our plan, then their premium, as you recall from September, really got lopsided. Of course, that will fluctuate to the DVD if it gets whacked. Um, so that's really sort of what we're looking at. So what, it, what, what we're trying to figure out now in terms of how we can calculate it at all is just working with them what we have as the DVD because then that's going to absorb 
and they learn a pain of claim for what we're assuming is this dollar amount is this dollar amount. What will fluctuate is the number of people in that plan. So in any given year, I mean, there were some projections in Eric's numbers early on further out that there may be another year there's a spike in retirement, the number of retirees in the plan. But right now, what's giving us the savings is that we're assuming a certain number of folks in the DUD, in the HRA, given the DUD at that dollar amount we're projecting them at, for that, or starting to give them. So yeah, I guess all I'm saying is, is does it make that much of a difference, being that he had factored that in, and then we went back and tweaked and said, put in the whole pre-2009 thing. So I don't we, know haven't, that that we haven't gotten back any numbers from him on the, yeah. on the, on the 2009, and it might not, but, you know, um, the age and the the age and the years of service make a difference for how long a person stays on the plan. Mm -hmm. So if they are 40, they're going to stay on it longer than they will if they're 55. So that was the whole point of that. I would say to the actuarial number. Eric said, and y'all have tweaked for 55 in, the, in 2009, just like it's stated in his presentation. On the DDDs, uh, Daniel, I, I, you want to review the uh, spouse DDD? I think we need to get all of it on the table. We need to know what the numbers are. And, and that could, it might be a matter of the DDD, if, the DDD, if you look at the combined amount of DDD, that number isn't changing, like if you add the retirees amount and the spouse's amount, then it's, it's, the it's still the same. Yeah. But if you... One person will get more and one person will get less, if, if you keep the same amount. But, but my, my question is, my, my overall question goes to why are we supplementing spouse they didn't work for the city and in this scenario what you showed in numbers is is that we're supplementing close to 75 percent of their thing and to me our obligation is to the person who worked here if they want to have coverage there's a cost to that coverage and that's what it is so we had this discussion in 2008 and everybody was like no 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 but the reality is had we just done that formula, then we wouldn't be having this health care discussion. Well, it's the, one of the gentlemen I talked to before. I mean, him and his wife been on the city plan for 60 years. It's a lot longer than he worked. And we've been supplementing that, and that's what I don't think is fair because it actually really hurts the employees. Because the employees now and into the future are the ones, you know, I mean, eight hundred dollars a month—that's ten grand a year. So we have that to look look at, calculate, and adjust in the DDD. So anyway, I mean, I think collectively we all want the same thing. We want to get to making sure that we can take care of the employees. Guys, um, I was just going to say, I think what Daniel's saying is really the same as the surcharge. I think the question is, what's the fair amount of the surcharge? I think there's a difference between saying you're not going to allow spouses to be covered at all or saying, okay, yes, we need coverage, but there's a, a, there's a cost, and then the employee itself can figure out whether or not that cost is makes more sense with the city or you know or or something else so i think that's the difference a hundred dollars a month sounds a little low and i think there probably be a lot of people who would be willing to pay more than that the question is what is the right amount well i mean what i was saying really was is that your your spouse can get insurance but whatever the cost is it is the cost you know we're supplementing Total that cost. right now and we you shouldn't be employers portion and the employee's yeah. portion. And some, yeah. some employers do that. They charge the whole, you know, it, it, it costs $1,000 a month. That's what it is. That's what they pay. So y'all look at that option and say, well, yeah, regardless I mean, of well, what options, direction do you all need in order to run numbers before next week? Do you, are we running numbers on 
the employees, I mean, the spousal coverage, whatever it is, just think are we, we taking, are we saying no spousal coverage, or are we doing the surcharge? Well, you can't, you can't. You can do that. Well, you have to, no supplement is what no. we're looking at. That's what I'm asking. I mean, you could just, we could not do any spousal coverage. I mean, not offer it. I mean, that's an option too, isn't it? Well, if they didn't have credible coverage, you'd have to. We'd have to, to offer it to them at yeah. the full price. We don't have to. We don't have, we don't have to subsidize right. it, but we could offer it to them at the full price. Or, well, there's some places though that you don't, you don't have to offer spouse coverage. I think we ought to just. Or employees. You have to offer that to pay for it. I think we just got to look at all the numbers because at the end of the day. The reason we're here is to try to figure out a plan that gets us a sustainable plan for the employees from now on. It wouldn't matter because the budget would go down, not up. As long as the top line number doesn't change, it doesn't matter. But a lot of the other stuff is the eligible would be 365 and 065 retirees. And then you, then you get into the spouse coverage. And that's all retired. Okay. Add to that population active retired prior to July. All these are retirees. Who's eligible? That's the other question. Anybody that's retired uh, as of January the first of nineteen is eligible. <laughs> Out for pre and post. Yeah. Say it again, Hunter. Anybody that's retired as of January the 1st is eligible for pre and post HRA. January 1st, 19? Yes. Yeah, going twice. <laughs> retire or retirement? It's really December 31st. Yeah. Okay. Pre and post. December by December 31st, is that 2018. Retired or retirement eligible? I apologize. Is that retired or retirement eligible? Where is that? Alan, they've been talking about retired. Well, we've been talking about both retired and retired okay. eligible. Pre and post. We have folks retirement eligible this year. They're going to be retirement eligible by the end of the December 31st, but they're not going to retire. Right. So, like, they right. may choose to still work. So, the folks that have hired since July, they're going to be eligible. Yeah. Well, I can't be. Well, no, no, I'll be right. Well, she has eight years. Right. And she was 2008. She's eligible, but yeah, she, she still eight. has eight years before she's even eligible. Right. So, she has eight years. Another year on top of that, she's 65. Mr. Vaughn? Mr. Vaughn? Okay. Yeah, her, 
her issue was the age fifty five. That's right. Yeah. She wasn't. She was. Who? That oh, the lady here. Yeah. yeah. Because she she's. Yeah. She said she's 40. Steve, ask her. She's on here. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me? We All can. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> pre and post. If they're eligible come 31st, but what about anyone who's hired before 2009? They get to that point. Are they going to be both pre and post at the same time? Uh, uh, how are we going to make that decision if we don't know what the numbers are and what that affects in long term thing? Well, that's the number that we have. That, that's I mean, the, no offense, but I mean, you're asking me to, to just say that's yes fine. or no. We can figure that out too, but y'all are being awful certain on the other Well, point I thought we had. Well, my, my idea was I thought we were going to get numbers. That was my understanding of why we wrote down all these lists and stuff today. So maybe I misunderstood. So no, we probably, why don't we, well, why don't we kind of think about this, study this a little more until we get back together. Right. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. The budget will be, we're running the budget out of days. Is, is well. The revenues are the well, I just, I, I'm going to make a decision. I want to be able to say I'm making this decision because of this. If I just make a decision on a motion, it would be, be stupid. I agree, but we'll change it. So I don't know that Aon is going to, we may not have all the numbers back when Aon We ought to be able Tuesday. to ballpark it. They've, they've had enough information from us. And they come up with a lot of recommendations. <laughs> so we're hey, we sat in this room and we were able to do it. With Tower Watts is sitting there moving that needle around. They know what our basis is, so if you make the changes, what does that look like? And they've given us a lot of information that we did. Like, that's how we made some of the projections that we've done for this already. point. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of they've posted their numbers and they're based on a certain uh, demarcation yeah, in terms of which population. So if we're moving that needle to population. See, I thought the, I thought the needle was always set at 2009. That's what I've been basing off of everything that we had here. Because if you looked at our population based on that, you've got really there's only about 700 people who fit that category. Everybody else is all way under. And well, then, then the reality of them being you know 20, like today, 25 have, years is 30 years or whatever it is now. With today's retiree population, and actually in the, the numbers that we pulled mm -hmm. from before, we, we know how much it will cost. Pay the DVD for retirees during their age. Per retirees. Per retirees and retirees. But are, are we using current numbers? Are we at the 80 20? Okay. No, the DVD is last year. They're no longer we do. I mean, I just we'll think just in that. We adjust that DVD to be our liability. So I, I also want to make something clear because what you said we're going to spend based upon current actuaries at 8.4. That number, if you look at the numbers that are out there based upon the retiree, that population grows over the next, that was a row a little bit over the next couple of years. So in future budgets, it's not going to be 8.4. Potentially, per the estimate, will be about 10.1. So we're still going to see some increase. In but, you're assuming, but you're assuming, you're assuming there's nobody going to time out. Well, you know, if you act. The actuarial, they'll tell you they have built in, that in, right? But you know, we More ability tables. realistically that oh. it doesn't always follow that. Right. Mm -hmm. So th this is the breakout they gave us in the present, the last presentation. Yeah. But again, you know, so that's but that's assuming the full population. Y'all have already capped off the population right. by drawing the line at the 2009 mark. So, so this is this is. This is not See, I thought that's what we were using as our basis for all of it was 2000. That was, that was you were in <laughs> before 2000. That was a new. That was a new. Yeah. New. What they were basing it on was anybody retired as of December 31st of this year was actually retired from the city, whether they were active when they retired or retiree already. Retired. But 
am I just making this up? Didn't we have this conversation about that that population? I mean, it was, a, I mean, what I have in my notes was it was around 700 people mm -hmm. that would yeah. stay in the system. We'd add back to the public. We add, we'd right. make it option mm -hmm. 1D instead of option 1D. 1D.76. Right. Seven, six. right. Yeah. What's changing now is discussions about how does the spouse's DVD factor in to the reduction. Just that spouse's DVD to, the, to, to the those retirees. Right. If we stay within that total dollar amount, or do we reduce yeah. the there'll be some DVD? We're about to lose a quorum, y'all. So um, any other questions you have for staff? That's uh, sounds good. There was an executive session item. Need to add rain to it. Yeah, if we're losing a quorum, though, I guess I'm. <laughs> do you need us to have it? Yes. Well, I don't think it accounts yeah, for the. Yeah. We're not voting anyway, are we? Can't do executive session. Yeah. Well, she can't even come to executive session. That's true. And then the summer schedule, I do need some feedback on that. I think we're good to go, other than the, the statutory issue Mr. Mr. Duvall just raised. So figure that out, y'all. I'll leave the room and y'all decide what you want to do. I, I, like, I like the summer schedule. I won't be sent to jail. <laughs> Not for this anyway. <laughs> I like the summer schedule. We need to Who's vote going to, to tell? Let, let's, uh, let's, 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 let's vote to approve the summer schedule with uh, um, re revisit the issue of all raised. Uh, move to a second. We don't need to vote during the All right. Session, okay, we don't vote after that. We like it. Okay. Keep rolling. Um, the... Um, Move, okay, uh, move, move, we adjourn. No executive session. Oh, well, we can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't. Okay. Say hi, Howard. Howard. You good, you good. We adjourn. You good? All right. Move to the second. Second. Say bye. 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 Oh, Miss Devine, get her eye. We're, we're done. Thank you all.